Lieutenant Chamber. Okay, <clears throat> can I confirm that members on Starleaf, Gemma Dolan, Melissa McHugh, Philip McGuigan, uh, and that you can all hear us oh, and see us okay? Yeah. yeah. Good, thank you. Uh, can I provide an overview of the day's business then? The committee will consider two oral briefings from the Assembly Research. The first is on the draft budget 21-22. The second is on the public procurement common framework. An oral briefing from the Construction Employers Federation also on the public procurement common framework. Uh, oral evidence from the Department of Finance on an SL1 relating to energy performance certificates. And then in closed session, then a further correspondence from the department regarding the RHI disciplinary process. Uh, there is also again a substantial amount of incoming correspondence, so you know, uh, members. Okay, can I advise members that they are welcome to use the Wi-Fi connected mobile devices as long as they are in airplane mode and all devices are muted? Uh, can I ask? Assembly Broadcasting to keep all members in the spotlight for the first five agenda items. If members are content, then we'll proceed through the agenda. Apologies. Can I ask if there are any apologies? As I say, the chairperson, Steve Aiken, has notified me that he will be late, but he should be here. Any other apologies? None. Okay. Can I ask the clerk then, has notice been received from any member who has delegated authority to another member of the committee to vote under the temporary standing order 1156? Yes, Miss Dolan has uh, delegated authority to uh, Mr McHugh uh, when she uh, leaves uh, before the end of the meeting. Okay, uh, declarations of interest then. Can I say uh, all members are obliged to declare any relevant financial or other interests at each committee meeting as applicable? Can I ask, have members any relevant interest to declare today? <coughs> no? Okay, moving on then to Chairperson's Business uh, 3.1, Northern Ireland Affairs Committee. Can I say, as previously agreed, uh, Steve met uh, formally, informally sorry, with the Chairperson of the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee on Tuesday the 2nd of March 2021 via Teams in order to discuss matters relating to the Northern Ireland Protocol. The chairpersons of the committees for Agriculture and the Executive Office also attended. A note of proceedings will be circulated to members shortly. It was provisionally agreed that the NIAC and the Assembly Committees would endeavour to meet regularly to discuss protocol issues. Uh, Westminster will provide a secretariat for those meetings with the chairpersonship revolving between Northern Ireland and Westminster. It is understood that Westminster may be considering amending its standing orders in order to allow formal joint meetings with Assembly Committees. Uh, as members are aware, the, Northern Ireland, uh, the NIA sorry, standing orders do not allow for any formal joint meetings of any kind except between committees of the Assembly. Uh, 3.2 then, Budget Bill. Can I say that I would like uh, to thank members for their contributions to the Supply Resolution and Budget Bill debates earlier this week. Uh, members are reminded that it will, uh, as is usual, uh, the Chair will speak on behalf of the Committee at the final stage of the Bill, uh, which will be on the 9th of March 2021. Uh, debates are currently not scheduled for any other stages, although that may well be dependent <laughs> on amendments. Uh, okay, moving on then, draft minutes of proceedings on of, for the 24th of February 2021. Can I say that the draft minutes of the meeting uh, on that date are at page 7. Can I ask members if they are content that the draft minutes for the 24th of February 21 are an accurate record of re proceedings? Can I ask for an agreement? Great. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you, members. Uh, moving on, matters arising. Uh, 5.1 an oral evidence uh, correction, uh, budget bill and spring supplementary estimates. Can I say that at last week's meeting, departmental officials erroneously advised that a provision of £430 million in the Executive Office spring supplementary estimates related to a liability in the victim's pension in the coming financial year. Uh, the department has written at page 16 of our packs to clarify that this provision is in fact <coughs> relates to liability associated with the survivors of historical institutional abuse uh, and the clerk uh, circulated the correspondence to members as soon 
as it was received. Can I ask the members have any comments? Well, Mr Chairman, um, and Mr Acting Chairman, it was a genuine mistake, though. It obviously uh, headed off at the pass further questions, which undoubtedly would have been asked of officials, because once we received the assurance that the £430 million was being allocated for the victims of the past uh, from terrorism, then obviously people felt, well, that's great news, uh, and let it sit at that. Had we been told it was as a result of the historical abuse inquiry, then I think it might have been a different tack. But as, as we've discussed before the meeting, it looks like there is provision for this anyhow in budget. So um, that's, that's to be welcomed, though I think there'll be a few slips between cup and lip before this has actually been paid out to those who need it. Yeah, just, just to clarify, just on the budget bill itself, Schedule 3, there in the Executive Office bill and also the Department of Justice bill, there, are, there is, if you like, authority. Uh, I don't know if you would go as strong as calling it provisional, though I did use that term, uh, but it's there in writing. But of course, there's no allocation of money or funding to that at this time. Any other members want to comment on on that correction? Again, it is an honest mistake. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to be too hard on officials. Uh, they corrected it very quickly, and we want we want officials to come to this committee confident and able to uh, say uh, what they think is correct. I do not want officials coming to this committee or any committee worried about what they say and what they don't say, because that will only lead to uh, less information coming to committees, uh, and I do not want to be in that position. I want to be people to be able to come here uh, not fearful of, of misspeaking or making a mistake, because the person who never made a mistake never made anything. So. Uh, that's where I stand and all. I will be robust, as you all know, but I will give people fair wind. And, you know, when people make mistakes, that they will inevitably do. Uh, as long as it's corrected in good time and there's no great repercussions, I, I, you know, I'm happy enough to move on. Are members content to note the correspondence? No. OK, thank you, members. OK, 5.2 Budget Bill, Northern Ireland 2021. Can I say... Uh, can I ask members to note the Speaker's letter to the Finance Minister at page 17 in respect of the introduction of the Budget Bill, NI 2021? Uh, that letter is dated on the 1st of March 2021. Is the committee content to note? Um, uh, Mr Chairman. Go on ahead, Jim. Um, no, no, but I have no option. And looking at the tone of the Speaker's letter, you'd think that we were all very happy uh, with the decision to adopt an accelerated passage, but every member of the committee, I think, was quite incensed by what we're being asked to do. Um, and uh, in the, ch the chair, Mr uh, Aiken's letter, it was very clear that the committee were extremely unhappy with what we were being asked to do, and yet the speaker's response would indicate that we were, we were content and everything was, was, was rosy in the garden. So just to say that I, like many others, felt we had a gun put to our head. We were warned that the word would fill it, fall in our heads if we didn't do this by Mrs McBurney, and we had to do it. But certainly the Speaker's response does not in any way indicate to the Minister our feelings on it. But it's gone, it's done, there's nothing to do about it. But it cannot happen again, and next year we must do this properly. Must. Uh, yeah, come on, come on ahead. Uh, can I just make a comment that I think that uh, that uh, the last speaker is guilty of what he is accusing the speaker of, uh, and that as much as that, uh, I didn't feel any gun was put to my head one way or the other, and I thought it was the appropriate thing to do at the time. Uh, it was that I made that proposal at the time as well too, uh, and that uh, just as uh, the last speaker, Mr Wells, he speaks for himself, not for the committee. Well, that's nonsense, because the, the chair's letter made it very clear that the committee is a corporate body was extremely unhappy with being put into a corner and being told we had to adopt accelerated passes. So I suspect that you'd wish to withdraw that comment, Mr McHugh, because it's totally no, inaccurate. Can I, can I ask you to come through the chair? I don't think it was nonsense. Yeah. So, OK, listen, uh, thank you very much for your uh, comments. You've both placed your comments on record. They are both well made uh, with regards to how you feel uh, about this. There is a procedure here to follow, and I suppose the uh, the uh, speaker's letter probably reflects more of the process rather than the 
the, the, the mindset of this committee uh, going forward. There was debate on this issue. There was you know, great deliberation on proceeding with an accelerated passage and being agreeable to it. So there has, that has played out over the last number of weeks. Uh, so, you know, I suppose the letter that the chairperson wrote to the speaker uh, demonstrates that, illustrates that. But I suspect the speaker here has replied uh, in a process that, that he sees fit. Uh, so, further ado, then, can I, is the committee content to note the letter from the speaker? Agreed? Agreed. Okay, and then without further ado, I'll hand over to the chairperson who has entered the room. Can I just say I feel aggrieved that I haven't been able to welcome on Starleaf the famous, the new, the new <laughs> world famous Colin Pigeon. Uh, extraordinaire, uh, but I'll leave that to you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed. And may I apologise to the committee for being adrift for the beginning of the meeting. Uh, to say the least, I unfortunately I was delayed. I was dealing with uh, some of the absurdities of the protocol and some of the issues to do around the budget. As you may well aware, no, I think it's four hundred and ten million in Barnet consequentials that the, the uh, Chancellor has announced. There are certain issues about corporation tax. There are certain issues also about free port, uh, VAT, and a few other bits and pieces. But I think those will unfold. Uh, I think many of you will be aware of the feeds of, as has they been coming in. But obviously. That will sort of colour our discussions, obviously, with the, uh, the finance department over the next sort of week or so, particularly as we look at how that is likely to be dispersed and moved on to that as well. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Vice Chair, for stepping in at sort of short notice, and thank you very much indeed, team, to do that as well. Move on to the next item on the agenda. I think it's item number four: draft minutes of proceedings oh, for so we're six. six. We're six. six. Oh, six. That's right. My apologies. We're, we're very productive in your. You were. Huh? We are very productive in that case. <laughs> Should do it more often. Right. Okay. If we move on to uh, I, Colin, are you there? The famous Come Colin in. Pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> Can I have your autograph, Colin? <laughs> <laughs> the most famous researcher since time began. Yeah. Do you know that you're on the national news as well as the local news? Global as well. Yeah. I, I've been getting messages from all over the world, actually. So, um, my my cat uh, has an admirer in Brazil via Instagram. So, um, <laughs> all I can say, Colin, is uh, you handled it with such a degree of aplomb and the rest of it that it was uh, actually a joy to watch. And I think, as many people put it this way, there's far more people now know that there's a Northern Ireland Assembly than there was beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> but that said, that said, team, uh, we're, it's the oral briefing here on the draft budget 21-22. It's designed to inform the committee's scrutiny of the draft budget part of the departmental briefing on the 10th of March, on the feedback to the public consultation. Uh, research papers, assembly research papers, page 22. Department of Finance consultation paper is 59, and further correspondence uh, from the Department of Resole Authorities in the table papers. Okay. Colin, would you like to kick off, please? Yes, okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, section 1 of the paper covers a, a, a large range of issues which are obviously very familiar to members of the committee in relation to the timing of this budget process and also the uncertainty around. The, the quantum or the amount of money that the executive has to allocate. Um, so, arguably, this paper probably doesn't contain as much uh, number crunching as you might expect, um, but in the circumstances, it's difficult to know what numbers you would crunch. Um, uh, many of the issues that were raised in Section 1 have been, obviously, they've been well aired in this committee, but also elsewhere in, in plenary and, and in other probably in other committees as well. Um, I think what we have managed to add is by drawing all this together into one place, um, it's actually quite interesting to look at the, at the range of different events, if you want to call them that, that, that have formed the timeline that has led up to this, this budget process. Um, so page 25 introduces the concept of this budget timeline. Um, what what we've done is focus on those events which either impact on the timing of the budget or the budget process or those um, that have impacted on the amount of money that's available um, through Barnet or, or through other uh, through other means. 
Um, so in relation to the timetable, I mean, th this is this is important. It, it, it harks back to the conversation that was just going on the committee a moment ago about um, about uh, accelerated passage in a way, and that that what's happening is is that the the process has been compressed towards right at the end of the year, um, and obviously the anticipated timetable that the committee got last summer was that the executive would be bringing a draft budget around September time. And obviously that, that didn't happen for, for various reasons, which are explained in, or, or, or referred to in the paper, but, but which you know, all know about. Um, I do also want to flag Hang up just, this just a, just a quick one. Um, it, it was only when I actually saw figure one and looked at it fairly closely, I realized sort of the complexities and how it was going back and forth and the rest of it. That is actually a very useful way of sort of showing sort of how the process went. And I don't know if you're discussing with some of the other researchers from the other committees and the rest of it. That is a very useful piece of information, just looking at it in that format. And having seen that, I'd sort of, it must have been, it sort of brought it home to me in a way that uh, you know, I knew there were quite a lot of sort of steps that had gone back and forth. That in sort of one sort of figure encapsulates a lot of the issues we've having to deal with. Okay, right. Well, that that's really good feedback. Thank you, and I, I will pass that on to if. Um, well, actually, Aidan's probably watching because he's he's coming on next. Um, it was Aidan that put that together, so um, uh, he'll be delighted to hear that. Um, I also do want to flag that that believe it or not, that that figure one is actually the condensed or abbreviated version, and we have published. Um, a full version on the website, which is an interactive timeline. We've never done this before, so it's using new, a kind of new approach, new technology. Um, and, and what it does is take right back to the first meeting of the assembly after the NDNA agreement, and it and it um, enables you to follow through each each individual process and click on and get the appropriate video. So, where, um, for example, it talks about a ministerial statement. When you when you go to that time in the timeline, it actually takes you directly to the video of that ministerial statement. So it's possible for an interested party to sit and piece together the entire process, which we thought was was probably even perhaps building upon um, what you've just said, Chair. So, I, I, but I do appreciate that, and um, I think what is particularly, if I can just focus on Figure One again, what is particularly important about that is what we've we've highlighted through the colour scheme is to show where a particular occurrence or event has occurred at the UK level rather than at the devolved level, which has then had a knock-on impact on the budget process in one way or another. And you can see that um, there have been a relatively large number of events which are in the green of the sort of um, Westminster Parliament, which obviously are events which are outside the executive's control. And I think to be fair to the executive, to be fair to the minister and officials, you know, there there are a sequence of events there which they, they really could do nothing about. Um, so uh, that's to, to sort of place that on on the record there. Um, obviously, there's more detail on, on, on each of those events in the paper. Um, but I do want to draw attention to... Uh, point that I made on page 27, or it's on page 27 in your packs, um, that there were, in a period of 17 days, four different ministerial statements by the Minister of Finance in the Assembly. Um, I don't think they were all oral, some were written, but the fact that the Minister had to make those four statements in a period of only 17 days suggests that, as well, it, it underlines how unsettled the situation has been. Um, and how difficult it has been for for uh, certain elements of this budget to be put together. So, having sort of mentioned the uncertainties and the difficulties, uh, I'm now going to turn to what we do know. Um, so, if we look at box one, which is on page 30 of your packs, it just runs through the different uh, sources of funding for the executive budget. Um, and the rest of the paper sort of follows through in the same order of those those different elements. So we start with the, the fiscal transfer and then move on to the more devolved elements. Um, so with that, uh, Chair, I'll, I'll continue to walk through those in the order that they're presented. Um, 
So the first thing we've got here in this budget that we've never had before is the concept of core and non-core funding mm -hmm. that was presented in the spending review. Um, and what it's, in my mind, what, it, what, what it's trying to convey is the concept of, of, in effect, what's the sort of rolling forward funding that Northern Ireland always gets? And then what's the one-off funding due to the exceptional circumstances of the pandemic or um, exit from the EU, which is also outside of that process? Um, so, yeah, sure. yeah. Colin, can I just ask there briefly? Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned core and non-core funding. Is that a, that is that new terminology, or is that a new um, number or set of numbers to be put in the document? It's yeah. It, it, is, a, it is a new it's new terminology. Um, so they've not. I think they're just trying to convey that that rather than just put all of the all of the funding, including the future COVID funding that they knew was going to be allocated back in November into one block, that would, that would have conveyed the impression that, that as normally happens, that the, the, the block grant rolls forward and is, and is amended at the margins, whereas there's no suggestion that once the pandemic is over, those, those separate sort of non-core monies that are related to the pandemic response, I don't think there's any suggestion that those will recur. Um, you know, ad infinitum, uh, if that makes sense. Yep. Cheers. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, I mean, actually what that does is it, it does highlight in some ways one of the issues that's been raised. Uh, it was on the radio, I think, Monday morning. One of the the health and social care trusts was, was raising the issue about how COVID has exacerbated the existing problem with waiting lists in the health sector. Um, and that to tackle waiting lists long term, they're going to need a sustained period of, of, of recurrent funding, not one-off injections. And, and what the COVID funding is, is one-off. Um, and that to deal with the backlog that has resulted with that, I think we'll need a, a more sustained approach. Um, and it's not clear at the moment how that, that will be sorted out. Um, another issue related to that, I think, is perhaps my former colleague, uh, Dr. Thompson, raised several issues about waiting list data um, and the way that they, they may be not collected in the right way or that the wrong data are collected in order to, to highlight where the, the problem is. But that's that's sort of a separate issue, really. But I, I wanted to flag it up because it, it, it's such an issue in, in the public um, eye at the moment. Um, so. To go back to what the Minister of Finance has said, uh, he's talked a number of times about uh, it being a standstill budget. And I think, in, in essence, what he's talking about there is, is the core funding rather than the core and non-core and the other elements all put together. It is really the core funding which is at a standstill. Um, and if we look at box three on page 32, you can start to see where this non-core funding will be feeding in. Now, this is... Um, page 32 is the COVID funding, if you want to call it that, which was set in November. We already know that that has increased by, was it 300 million in February, a couple mm -hmm. of weeks ago, um, and that the executive has been given the permission to roll that forward into next year. And I believe, Chair, you were referring to the Chancellor's statement. Now you, you've got the, the jump on me there. I, I haven't, I haven't seen it. I, although a lot of it's been announced already, um, given how this is pandemic has developed, it seems very unlikely that this will be the last addition to the to the budget coming from that source um, before we're, we're through. Um, obviously, the eyes will be on the Chancellor's, or the detail of the Chancellor's statement um, once, once that's published. Um, just to go back to the issue of non-recurrent funding, Another thing that's happened since the paper was written, um, the Department for the Economy has published its uh, economic recovery plan. I think that came out on Friday evening sometime. Um, and that very specifically says it, it gives them an amount of funding that's needed for the first year, which is, I think it's around 200 million. But then it also points to the fact that this recovery is going to take longer than one year, which again highlights the issue, obviously, that, that, that we all know um, in relation to it being a single year budget and the issues that that um, causes in terms of longer term planning. Um, and we also know, I think from prior discussions we had about um, 
NDNA, go back to this time last year actually, that um, issues like nurses, pay, agenda for change, pay for nurses, uh, and hospital staff and teachers pay that came as part of that um, settlement can't be fixed with one-off packages because you you pay people more, they stay in their job, they continue to be paid at a higher level. Um, and that's fairly obvious, but it but it also needs to be factored into to future um, considerations. Um, to move on to pages 34, 35 of your pack, which I've talked a little bit more about the broader issues around the funding arrangements. Um, questions were raised early on by the Fraser of Allender Institute, which the Department of the Economy uses quite a lot to do work in, in relation to Northern Ireland about the suitability of Barnet to deal with a uh, pandemic situation. Would it distribute funding in a suitable way? Um, now, there's different views on that, but certainly one, one strong feature of Barnet is that it doesn't require um, negotiations. The Treasury can make its decision that it can get funding through quickly and through the speed has been an issue in responding to the pandemic. So, um, so while there may be issues about the amount of funding that comes or the, or, or the sequencing of it, um, the fact that it doesn't have to be negotiated is helpful. Um, and clearly the Treasury had, had responded to that in some extent last, uh, I can't actually see the timeline in front of me, I think it was 24th of July. The funding guarantee, but that was that's new. Again, that's a, that's a almost like a revolution in terms of um, evolved financing because there's never been this idea that before a Barnet consequential is generated, that the devolved administrations will be guaranteed a certain amount of money. Um, so that's that's new. Um, now I was looking back at a presentation I did for the committee just before the pandemic hit us. Um, and one of the things that I did was I mentioned in the NDNA, NDNA funding package, we had seen for the first time a pre-announced Barnet Consequential, which is in effect, the UK government said, yes, we have agreed a £2 billion package in relation to funding NDNA. Actually, £1 billion of that was going to be generated in future by Barnet Consequentials. So, Although the funding guarantee is totally new, there is an element that it was sort of, um, it was almost slightly preempted by that that um, announcement in relation to NDNA. Can I just um, ask on that, Colin? Sorry, if that's all right. Sorry. sorry. Yeah. So, is, is what happened, and did they say at the time that there will be um, a package of support? For Northern Ireland to support these issues and the re-establishment of the institutions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, did they say at the time this will be met through future Barnet allocations? Meaning, we anticipate there, you know, there will be a, like there will be a fiscal event within a couple of um, months, and will be there will be a Barnet consequences that flow from that, or did they not say it at the time and, and fill the detail in later? No, that that information, the information that we presented, um, uh, Chair, came from Department of Finance, didn't come from Treasury. So um, as I understand it, the sequence of events was the, um, the £2 billion figure was widely known and the fact that half of it was was in effect pre-announced by the consequentials wasn't known at the time. And they then were, were programmed to cover during, I think, what, what was then the delayed March budget. Um, so they would have been coming anyway. That's the that's how it was pre presented. Um, yeah, maybe ju maybe just maybe just for the sort of the records, there's Colin and sort of uh, Matthew won't know. I was up round the table when we were uh, at the final vinegar strokes of the NDNA when the budget was discussed, and actually it wasn't discussed. There was actually no commitment from the British government apart from the fact that there would be something, but nobody was able to tie any of the details down. And indeed, one of the things that was the discussions were still ongoing at the time when the Secretary of State and uh, Simon Coveney were both outside announcing the new decade, new approach, when we were still trying to bottom out what was actually in the budget because there'd been no guarantees given at all, really. So, I mean, I know a lot of people talk about, and I know we've heard the Finance Minister talk about the, the guarantees within the new decade, new approach. 
were actually sitting inside that room. There was no guarantees given. And that was all the party leaders from all the parties who were there at that time. So uh, I don't. I, I think the, the pressure then was to get the uh, executive back or the executive and the assembly back up and running. So I don't think that we can actually tie them to what was agreed or wasn't agreed because, quite frankly, it wasn't. Thanks, Chair. Thank you for that. Um, so, I guess um, what that brings us to is the question that I've asked on page 36 of your packs, which is whether a funding guarantee is likely to be repeated. Is that approach going to be taken again for the remainder of this year, or will it continue into the future? Um, because Although we've seen, we, we've seen and we've talked about already the number of different events that have occurred um, that have made it uh, difficult for, for budgeting. Before that, obviously, it was the absence of the Assembly. And then th th this isn't the first time that the Assembly has been in the position of receiving a budget late. Um, so the question is, will next autumn the executive be in the same position whereby it can't bring a draft budget because it doesn't know the size Colin, of the spending Colin envelope? From Colin, from your research, have we ever received the budget on time or early during the entire existence of the executive of the assembly? The, the last the last budget that I really remember being a, a being a fully sort of um, consulted on process in the assembly and going through full sort of committee stages um, in the autumn was probably fourteen. No, I think fifteen sixteen. Then the sixteen seventeen budget came late. Um, and it, that was just prior to really the. Um, now that was the last time that a budget was agreed by the assembly, if I remember rightly. And then obviously we, we all know that the, the, the devolution then then paused for for a long period. Um, so it has it has been some time before there has since there has been rather um, a, a settled process, and that's one of the reasons why obviously officials have been working um, and yourselves have been involved in in trying to consider and think about how a memorandum of understanding will work about future processes. Um, so uh, the question remains though, you know, I, will, 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 I, will I be sitting here or will someone else be sitting here in 22, uh, talking about the draft 22-23 budget at the, end of, uh, the, at the end of the financial year or will it be possible to have a, a, a longer, more considered engagement earlier on, starting in the autumn or, you know, a more, a more regularized sort of timetable. Um, I think this is important because when we look at box four and we see about this issue of shared prosperity or, or Brexit funding, um, that at the moment, as far as I can see, there are several questions that still remain about that. Um, well, I did raise the point on page 38, I think it was, your packs. But the, uh, the various devolved finance ministers have raised this issue with Treasury about shared prosperity and that it appears that the issue isn't settled. Um, so I thought it might be handy to include what the, the Treasury Statement of Funding Policy says about dispute resolution. And so on page 39 of your packs, there's an extract from that. And in essence, uh, I paraphrase slightly is what it says is if the DAs don't like what the Treasury does in terms of providing funding, um, they are free to raise it with the Treasury, um, which is an unusual, well, it might be an initial route to um, dispute resolution, but it's un unusual that that would be your only recourse to resolving a dispute. There's normally some sort of external body, as you all know. You may be an ombudsman or whatever. And even going back to the 1980s, academics were suggesting that perhaps the UK needed some sort of Territorial Exchequer Board was the term that was used, but some sort of external body that, that oversaw things to make sure it was fair. Um, fair is a difficult word, but th that it was appropriately handled, perhaps. Um, going beyond that, the funding policy doesn't mention anything except it makes a sort of passing reference to the Joint Ministerial Council. Um, and then it also just reaffirms that it, it remains the UK government's uh, responsibility to set fiscal policy, take macroeconomic decisions. Um, so, uh, on, on the basis that, that the um, the issue isn't settled, um, there is potential for there to be some level of disagreement about it. 
those appear to be the, the mechanisms that exist for resolving them. Um, uh, so I thought that was helpful to include. To move on from the fiscal transfer to talk a little bit more about what um, the statement funding policy calls self-financed expenditure, um, you see from figure two on page 41, the regional rate, as we know, I think from the minister's statement has been frozen. But what figure two tries to show is how reliant Northern Ireland is on the fiscal transfer. Relatively tiny proportion of the overall expenditure is funded via uh, local taxation. Again, this isn't particularly new to any of you, or I'm sure it's not new at all, in fact. Um, and it just the uh, Minister of Finance has obviously been talking in recent months about a fiscal commission. Uh, so that, that's perhaps something that, that will be addressed, assuming there's agreement on what that will look like, how it will function, and so on and so forth, um, we'll start to address in the coming period, whatever whatever period that will be. Um, I've included a bit in the paper on devolved taxes, although uh, they're a bit of a non-event, to be, to be frank. Um, they're included in <coughs> completeness, but there's not really a way about them. Um, I've highlighted the issue, and I think, Chairman, you did the same in the chamber, perhaps, that. Um, the draft includes 140 million of the RRI allowance for borrowing. Um, so obviously there's potential for a little bit more borrowing and the question is should departments be thinking about trying to borrow a bit more for a little bit more investment. Um, in relation to peace funding, uh, there's not much to say other than there is a commitment to meet to discuss and agree a timetable for it, but it will be, excuse me, based on what the Department of Finance said in their response to me, it, it won't be in this coming year that the expenditure starts to um, be incurred under that program. So, um, so move on now from where the money is coming from. Um, we can look at figure four. Uh, now the budget document says very explicitly that the allocations that it lists are not comparable with the, with the um, the allocations that were made the year before because of various um, in-year baseline adjustments and so on. Um, so in order to try and give some sort of feel for the allocations that were made and how they compared to previously, what we've done is look at the overall uh, sort of resource, non-ring fence resource Dell, and looked at the proportion of that which is allocated to each department. So what percentage of the whole, not in, in nominal amounts, but in, in terms of the proportion, which gives you some sort of feel for the kind of the preferences of the, of the decisions that are taken. Um, and that doesn't tell us all that much, apart from uh, an increasing allocation to health. Every paper I've ever written about budgets in Northern Ireland in the last 12 years has said there's more money going to health. That's not, again, that's nothing new. Um, but as, as we all know, that means that the budgets elsewhere get squeezed um, in order to fund that. Um, and we also now know that there's the ad, added dimension of new decade, new approach commitments, which um, from the correspondence I've seen from both education and justice committees, they have flagged issues relating to new decade, new approach commitments to do with teachers' pay and police officer numbers, which they don't apparently have the resource to meet. Um, so if those, if those uh, two sort of second and third largest budget areas are squeezed, um, the ability to, to meet those commitments that come from elsewhere uh, are, um, are obviously constrained. Uh, moving on to capital, figure five, we talked an awful lot about um, capital profiles and so on last week before the pigeon incident. So um, we know we know that from that, we know there have been issues related to COVID-19 and delays in, pro, in delivery of, of uh, projects on the ground. But we also know, as we discussed, that the profile actually isn't all that dissimilar from how it usually is. Yeah, so, so although there, there have been issues there, there hasn't been anything particularly extraordinary in that regard. Um, and then just to round up, uh, 
the issue with financial transactions capital has been one that's come up in this committee since since it existed in terms of the difficulty of spending it and so on. It's been a little bit of a, a, a back issue over the last little while because there have been other priorities, I think. Um, nevertheless, I think the last the last sort of allocations from that that I saw and were to Aussie University helping with their relocation and also more money going into the investment fund, the Northern Ireland Investment Fund. So whether these things would be considered your top executive priorities if you had a different funding source is open to question. Having said that, universities can drive growth through innovation and so on, and, and the investment fund, well, I don't know much about the investment fund, and it might be something that perhaps if the committee hasn't had a briefing on that for a while, it might be something perhaps uh, to think about. But um, the long and the short of it is that that basically is the paper. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to try and answer them. Sure, Martin. Any questions for Colin? Uh, Colin, yeah, go ahead. thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of points, and thank you for, again for a really um, useful note. I should also say, Chair, I put on the record my uh, was watching from afar while I was part watching because I was moving house, but a profound admiration for Colin's uh, birdmanship, but also. Um, Anger that I wasn't here to see it. <laughs> <laughs> there, are many, there are many other, there are many finance committee meetings I would have been happy to miss. But <laughs> it was beautiful. It was it, it, not to use the word. He kept it in his stride. He, he, he was he was kept it in his flight. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, uh, I was just going to ask about um, Colin about um, uh, the point about program for government and it, there's a it, the document itself. Uh, some departments are, seem to still be working to the programme for government, or at least for the purposes of having uh, um, a placeholder or a something to say they're working to a target. Did you did you look at that at all? And is that is there any? I mean, is there any agreed guidance on, on, on the status of that document? It, it seems fairly, you know, somnolent as it were, but it just sort of exists as a something to, which has headings and um, targets, even though they were never agreed. Uh. Um, in terms of there being in, in the, I think the process is ongoing about agreeing a new one, but in the, alongside that, the, uh, hmm, the executive office does publish um, outcome delivery plans and, and reports against those. So that, those same sort of measures that were introduced under that draft PFG have continued to, to exist in that slightly yeah, slightly obscure status, I suppose you might say. I mean, um, that, that seems to be what the, the civil service is working on in the absence of anything else. Um, and I think the intention, is the set from what I've heard, is that, that you know, the, the OBA approach will be continued, although it may be perhaps rearranged slightly and the indicators may change. I think there was a consultation on the indicators, perhaps. Um, but in terms of um, anything concrete, I, I can't offer anything. Can I just come in there a second, uh, Sir Matthew? Yeah. Sure. Colin, one of the issues to that, one of the problems that we've always had with the PFG process, unless it's actually aligned to something specific, like a budgetary outcome or an actual deliverable, one of our problems with our last PFG, it didn't seem to be linked anywhere to any sort of uh, fiscal responsibility or indeed sort of budgetary line, and there were no measures of effectiveness put into it rather than something woolly in the far right hand column. Um, but it seems to me that the PFG, the draft PFG that's been put out, seems to have been produced separately from the budgetary process, because I don't think from what I'm reading through the draft PFG and what I'm seeing draft, looking through the budget, there doesn't seem to be much in the way of alignment. Um, well, it, it's been an ongoing uh, matter of, of debate, and going back uh, many, many, many years when um, uh, current Permanent Secretary for Health, I think, was Budget Director or, or, or something like that. I, mean, I remember him telling the Finance Committee then that, you know, in theory it was possible to align budgets with outcomes, but in practice it's very difficult to do. And the OBA approach doesn't really seem to stick to do that at all, um, apart from, do you remember the former Deputy First Minister saying that it would? Uh, he said that in committee. Um, the, 
the committee for the executive office, I suppose, going back a number of years now. Um, and, and I think that's the intention. But the reality is, and, we, and we've looked at this a few times um, in, in research in the different forums, the, that linking budgetary inputs with outcomes is very difficult. Um, questioned even in some places in the literature whether it's valuable or whether it skews behaviour. Um, and I think that's partly what's behind this drive for the outcomes-based approach. So where you have this, these various indicators that, that say, well, actually, as long as we're moving forward on these indicators, Northern Ireland as an entity will be a better place. And therefore, it doesn't matter too much exactly what finance get, gave rise to those improvements. Of course, the difficulty with that will be if you can't you can't identify what brought about success, you can't then repeat it and expand it. So mm -hmm. um, maybe there are other mechanisms in place. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Colin. Any other questions for Colin? Okay, Colin, thank you very much indeed as usual. Thank you. And thank you. could I ask Aidan to come in, please? Oh, sorry, Aidan. Yes. Hi, Aidan. Can you hear us? No, can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah, we can, Aidan. And first of all, thank you very much indeed for the hard work on figure one on the previous document. Uh, sort of, uh, Colin has said that you worked on it. And I think as a visual representation of some of the complexities over the last year, I think that was very useful. And thank you very much indeed for your work on that. Uh, team, we're having the oral briefing is on the committee scrutiny of the public procurement common framework, and we're having a briefings with the Construction Federation Employers Federation later on today. Uh, Aidan's going to give us a quick brief on it, and its assembly research paper is on page 135. Aidan, over to you, please. Okay, so I'm just going to share uh, Aidan. Okay. Yeah. okay so. Yeah, I know the procurement's um, common framework. Um, I will cover the common framework's common purpose. Um, some general considerations that um, emerge from uh, common frameworks. Look at what the public procurement common framework uh, proposes to do, and then we can get Sorry, sorry, Ian, apologies. You're you're quite broken up, and we're having difficulty. Oh. We're having difficulties recording it. I'm, I'm so sorry, Chair. I'm... We're going to try and sort of we'll try. Do now. you want to try and log off and on again, Aidan, or something? It's just uh, the, the visuals are, are perfect. We can see the presentation, but just can't understand you. Okay, we'll, we'll log on. Sorry, members. No, it's okay. Just uh, bite our time. I don't think we had too much technical problems in Henry yesterday, other than Mark Durkin nearly missing his dinner, which was <laughs> <laughs> awful fun. Well, it just showed you some places that worked reasonably well, and other places it was absolute, you know, it was quite dodgy. Yeah. Hungry Mark Durkin is not the sort of thing you want around this place. <laughs> no, it's not. No. <laughs> Aiden's just trying to log back on again, so. Yep. So with the committee, Chair's Liaison's committee meeting yesterday, we were all sitting, and one of the objects was, you know, my great star leaf was working and nobody could get it up on it. I kept <laughs> up. And about future funding and what we needed to do. Mm. Here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's got a bit better. Um, it's, uh, hopefully it's better for you. Um, well, we could see you, which is a start. <laughs> <laughs> um, can, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can, Ian. Yeah, okay. that's, much, much, that's I'll, much better. I'll try... Uh, Share this screen again. Um, uh, if that doesn't work, let's call all without it. Um, how's that? Can you see that um, presentation? That's better. Thanks, Aidan. Yeah. 
Fantastic. Okay, so as I said, uh, we're going to look at uh, what the common frameworks are and their purpose. Um, some general considerations emerging from that. Then look at a bit more detail of what the public procurement uh, common framework proposes to do, and raise some specific points um, emerging from. Yeah. Unfortunately, this, this is. It's going to raise more questions than, than, than answers. Uh, and I've peppered the paper uh, with some, some scrutiny points throughout. Hopefully, this will um, assist uh, the, the committee in its scrutiny of, of this framework and, and others. So, moving on to what the own uh, frameworks are and why they're being developed. Well, prior to the UK's exit from the EU, EU law helped to create a UK wide approach to policy in certain areas. Um, following the UK's exit from the EU, these powers, uh, powers these areas have returned to the, the UK. Um, some of these powers devolve, uh, intersect with devolved competences. So the common framework has been developed to, to replace the previous EU common approach with a UK common approach to policy, whilst allowing for some divergence in devolved areas. They've been underpinned by three principles that were uh, agreed by the UK government and the devolved administrations. Um, so these principles essentially set out the reasons why a framework should be developed. They state that a, a, a common framework must respect uh, the recent settlements and also that they should respect the uh, recognised sorry the social link linkages um, between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland and adhere to the Belfast uh, Stoke Good Friday Agreement. Um, the, the frameworks the framework has been developed part of a five-step uh, process. Um, the public procurement framework is at step four, and this is the point at which committees across the, the UK uh, can scrutinise the framework concurrently. And just to note that there's 154 areas of uh, former EU law identified as intersecting with the devolved competencies. Of these, um, 115 have been determined as requiring no action, no further action. Uh, 22 have been determined to require non-legislative um, action and 18 are determined to require um, legislative action. So there are some general considerations emerging from this. First of all, the committee may wish to consider how this uh, a common framework um, uh, marries up to the, the underpinning um, uh, principles. Um, is it consistent with the three underlying principles? Um, is it being developed for one of the purposes? That it's, it's stated that the common frameworks can be developed for. Is it consistent with devolution settlements? And is it consistent with um, the, the Good Friday Belfast Agreement? Um, there's also the issue of whether or not there are any impacts um, in relation to the, the Northern Ireland Protocol. Now, th th as the committee is aware, the, the, the protocol um, ensures that certain areas of EU law are maintained um, in Northern Ireland. Um, following the UK's exit from the EU. Um, because of this, um, maybe certain common frameworks that cannot be as common as, though they might limit how common a common framework can be, um, because certain laws apply to Northern Ireland only. Um, now, with the, the public procurement one, um, the, the outline uh, agreement states that there are no um, there are no protocol impacts, uh, and the protocol itself does not cover um, procurement. However, given the complexity of, of the protocol, um, I, I think the committee might want to consider whether there, whether there are any indirect impacts. And one that occurred to me um, is the possibility that um, the, 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 the fact that the, the protocol maintains product, uh, EU product standards in, in the EU, or in Northern Ireland, sorry, um, whether that may have caused issues when it comes to um, the procurement of goods in Northern Ireland. So in addition to the protocol, um, the committee may also want to consider the, the interaction between um, any common framework and the Internal Market Act. Um, this, this is a bit of un unpicking. So the, the Internal Market Act sets out uh, general market access principles for the UK internal market. That is, um, there is mutual recognition. So, if a good or service is uh, meets a legal standard in one area of the UK, it is thought to meet the uh, legal standards across the UK and, and can be accessed in every part. And the non-discrimination principle um, 
uh, uh, hold that um, any regulation in one part of the UK can um, not discriminate against good or other parts. Um, so the the the, the um, this exercise did some of the participation somewhat particularly Scotland, who argued that this uh, that these general principles um, of market access constrain the competence of the devolved legislature and that it should be the common frameworks rather than the internal market act that should uh, regulate the, the, the UK internal market. Um, so the act as enacted contains provisions uh, whereby the Secretary of State can pass legislation to exclude an area from these general internal market access principles and um, where that area has a common framework. Now it's not clear um, whether the public procurement framework is one of those. Um, and to, to, my, to my knowledge, I have seen those powers being used. Um, another issue that I um, would consider is um, the ongoing scrutiny of, of common frameworks in general. Now, these are, these are living documents in the sense that they set out uh, processes and procedures that will govern um, policy in Northern Ireland on an ongoing basis. Um, they are also documents that could be amended uh, and reviewed. Um, however, there's no clear um, indication of how scrutiny uh, will go on uh, into the future, um, what the mechanisms for that scrutiny will be. And this is something that has um, um, exercised the, the, the Lord's um, Common Framework Scrutiny Committee. The, the same committee in the Lord's has also been interested in the issue of stakeholder um, consultation. Um, it's not clear in the documents who has been consulted with elements of these common frameworks and on what basis they were um, selected for that consultation. Um, the, the, the common framework document, I don't think it's a bit light on financial information. Um, so we don't have any indication of if there are any financial implications and if so, how they to be funded. And then finally, from a general point of view, um, the UK government has is aware that uh, uh, that, that COVID nineteen has delayed um, the development of um, common frameworks. Um, the one that we're looking at today is one of the most developed, but it's it's, it's given the uncertainty, uh, it, there's a possibility that further delays may, may occur. So moving on to the public procurement common framework and its purpose, it's not a legislative common framework and essentially sets out the working practices between the UK government and the devolved administrations on domestic and international public procurement. Um, with regard to the latter, it commits all parties to the uh, World Trade Organization's um, government procurement agreement and any other international agreements that the UK enters in to that effect procurement, including the, the trade and uh, cooperation agreement between the UK and the EU. So, Essentially, it recognises the need for a common approach to procurement across the UK, UK but it, it also allows um, parties to develop their own procurement policy on a no surprises basis uh, through consensus and consultation. To do this, it creates vehicles for the discussion of this policy and sets up processes through which divergence can be managed. So all of this is facilitated through um, uh, monthly meetings that occur at official level. And there's a twice yearly uh, liaison meeting as well. And the, the common framework sets out mechanisms for the monitoring of the framework, its review and amendment, and um, for dispute resolution. Uh, the dispute resolution is something I'll come back to in this next slide. So, some specific considerations. Um, well, first of all, uh, the meetings that I mentioned, the, the, the monthly and uh, biannual meetings, uh, will be minuted, but discussions are to be confidential at those meetings. Uh, this is raises an issue of uh, transparency and how that may limit uh, or constrain the, the, the committee's ability to scrutinise the, the functions of, of, of the body set up by the, 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 the common framework. Um, there's a large section, the largest section of the, of the uh, proposed framework um, awaiting uh, agreement by all parties. That's section three in operational detail. Um, there's no indication of, of when that agreement will be reached. Um, the dispute mechanism that I mentioned, that's to be based on existing uh, devolution uh, arrangements. 
uh, through the, the, the Joint Ministerial Committee, I believe. Um, these are the, the Indonesian arrangements are being reviewed as part of the Dunlop review. This review has been completed, but has not uh, as yet been published. Um, there's no indication whether this will be published during the committee's scrutiny window on this on the framework. Um, nor is there any indication of what, if any, implications this might have, this review might have on this dispute mechanism. Um, and. In a similar vein, there are a number of items still under discussion. Um, the, these include um, the, how the UK government and the devolved administrations will engage on the, that WTO government procurement agreement that I mentioned, and also the, the final theme within the, the common framework on um, uh, procurement and international agreements. Um, so again, no indication of whether these discussions will um, uh, to, to, will end uh, during the, the, this, this, this um, uh, scrutiny window and, and what implications these discussions might have on the final document. Um, and then two, two further areas um, relating to ongoing um, policy and developments in the procurement arena that the, that the community might want to consider as well are the UK Green Paper on Transforming Public Procurement. Um, this has promised an overhaul of UK procurement, procurement policy, although the, the Green Paper states it is anticipated to be on wholly reserved um, matters. Um, so the committee may be interested to know from the department what consultation the department has received from the UK government on this, given the, the most surprises ethos um, outlined in the, the, the Public Procurement Common Framework. And also, maybe the, the name may, we may also be interested in the, the, the Department's views on this green paper as uh, setting the sort of parameters of, um, uh, of common pu public procurement for policy across the UK going forward. And then finally, um, the Common Framework's been developed at the same time as there's been a refresh of the Northern Ireland Public Procurement Board um, including a, a new uh, uh, makeup and and some new uh, roles. Um, so it's, the committee might also be interested to, to talk uh, in the department's views on how how this um, procurement board will feed into the public procurement framework structure and how, if it is to be involved, the the confidential nature of the the, the, the monthly and biannual meetings might um, affect or limit its involvement. So I'm sorry if that's gone on a bit, uh, Chair, but um, thank you for your time and hopefully I can, I can answer some questions. Okay, thanks very much indeed, Ian. Jim? Oh, yeah. oh sorry. Jim Allister. Jim Allister, sorry. I, yeah. uh, I just wanted to ask you a bit further about the impact of the protocol, because it seems pretty clear to me that given that the protocol uh, necessitates compliance with EU standards on goods, that it's now impossible to then to have a functional common framework across the UK where one part of the UK is subject to different standards than the other. Is that not really what this comes down to? Um, that, I, to, to, I'm sorry, again, this is one of these, these areas where I don't have any firm answers. That, there's, I have I've seen very little uh, on on this. Um, the document itself says that there are no protocol implications. However, it seems that there, are. Th th there could be, and, and um, so uh, my, my recommendation, uh, not recommendation, uh, the, the question uh, is, is included in the paper to um, possibly ask the department have they considered this and. Um, and if so, what other uh, possible indirect um, implications there might be? I'm sorry, I can't give a, a, a firm answer on that. Um, uh, and you did point out the apparent contradiction between the imposition of the protocol's obligations and the affirmations of the Internal Market Act as to non-discrimination and equality uh, in terms of access and all these issues. That too seems to be equally conflicting, is it not? 
Um, so I was considering the Internal Market Act in relation to the interaction of common frameworks rather than the protocol. So the, the interaction of the, the Internal Market Act and the protocol is not something I have considered. Um, however, I would be happy to look at it in, in more detail for you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I think that would be good. Thank you. Comes? Sorry, Matthew. Can I just ask you, okay. thank you, Aidan. Um, you mentioned the specific, um, uh, you mentioned the point that the common frameworks document mentions the um, relationship between north and south here uh, as a specific and distinct feature in Northern Ireland. Is there any um, me further specific mention of the impact of, uh, well, some of the issues that are concerning lots of people around divergence in services standards and, for example, you know, lack of clarity on data flows, but mutual recognition of qualifications. Um, is there any specific, does it deal with those specific disruptions at all? Not that the, necessarily um, the framework would, but does it, um, in your research, did you? This, I, my, my research was confined to just this specific framework. Sorry, uh, uh, my, my research was confined to just this um, uh, specific framework um, and those issues. Um, uh, did not, didn't come up. Okay. Thank you, Matthew. Okay. Okay, Tim. Just there, there's a few questions that Adrian's obviously raised in, raised in his research paper. I think we should uh, pass those on for um, sort of mm -hmm. further um, uh, further uh, discussion with the um, department if we are content. Great. Agreed. Do you want raised a brief on the internal contract? Yes, please. And also, if we could look to get Reyes to uh, look at the internal market bill and the implications that that has, particularly to do with this as well, if we could do some research on that, if we are content. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Aidan, thanks very much indeed. Thank you, Chair. I believe it. Are we six minutes ahead? Hold on. Oh, come on, this is, this is not our committee. Uh, <laughs> is, Mark, is Mark and David, David there? I think they are. Mark, David, are you there? Yay! You are indeed. You know, shock horror on our committee. We're actually ahead of time for once. <laughs> okay, Tim, and we welcome back good friends of the uh, committees, uh, Mark and David, and indeed uh, good friends of the assembly. Because I understand you're on this morning with the infrastructure committee as well. And um, and we're this is particular briefings on the public procurement common framework, and that just refers to the brief we just had from Reyes. Clark's briefing note is at page 198. The Construction Employers Federation submission is on page 203. And the Department of Finance correspondence on under threshold opportunities and access to Northern Ireland firms for uh, public procurement for the Republic of Ireland is page 206. Mark, over to you, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come back again and present to the committee today uh, on UK procurement com framework. Uh, I'm Mark Spence, Managing Director of the CEF, and I'm joined again this week by David Fry, who's our Director of External Affairs. Uh, we have some, some very brief uh, opening remarks, after which we'd be very happy to take questions. And I would say at this stage as well, uh, the committee would be welcome if they wish to ask us any wider questions on procurement generally or the procurement board. Uh, the committee will have seen our email to the committee on the 4th of December uh, last year when we made our initial comments in response to CPD on the 4th of November regarding the draft common framework. Our comments are focused on three main areas, uh, under threshold opportunities, disputes and UK-wide frameworks. Threshold opportunities, and by that what we mean is capital projects, construction projects, for example, under £4.7 million. So that is actually a significant number of opportunities. Uh, in Northern Ireland. For those opportunities, our strong view remains that procurement regionalisation uh, must not take hold in the UK. The UK procurement market uh, has been one and should continue to be one in which uh, Northern Ireland contractors have had great success seeking opportunities across the four nations of the UK. Uh, we therefore believe there needs to be great caution exercised where individual administrations or procurement authorities are considering new approaches or different approaches to these below threshold works that could be construed as protectionist and therefore lead to a, a negative spiral. It was in this context we're very frustrated that the content of the Cabinet Office, PPN 1120, that was published on 15th of December. On the matter of reserving under threshold opportunities, local parties within Great Britain can now run a competition and specify that only suppliers uh, located in the geographical area can bid 
This could be UK-wide to support the domestic supply chain and promote resilience and capacity, or it can actually be done on a county-by-county -county basis. Additionally, sustainability could be described by reference to where the supplier is based or established uh, and has substantive fitness operations, meaning it is on the ground and, and working for 12 months in that location. Great Britain is a major growth region for our members and has been for the last decade. A significant element of this may have been over threshold works, but there still remains a significant amount of work uh, done by our members at below threshold levels, and we wish to see that accessibility uh, continue. Uh, our members are very successful, uh, and we are very concerned now at the restrictions that Cabinet Office potentially could be putting in place of that market. Uh, this does nothing for the continued success of the UK's internal market and from the perspective of our local NI-based contractors, it's a hugely unnecessary potential curtailing of existing markets at the very time when they need the widest possible markets to emerge from this pandemic. I'm going to hand over to David, who's going to look at some of the other implications of the paper. Um, yeah, thanks Mark. So within that same Cabinet Office document, and, and I suppose referring back to your, your previous session, uh, with regard to the protocol, there is a section around under threshold opportunities that are taken forward with respect to Northern Ireland or, as we would understand it, by Northern Ireland government departments, clients or COPEs. Uh, in the Q&A on the exemptions to the Cabinet Office policy, the procurement policy note specifically cites that the policy should not be applied to below threshold procurements which are of cross-border interest, i.e. which may be of potential interest to suppliers from EU member states, including the Republic of Ireland, and which involves the provision of goods into Northern Ireland. Uh, and then there is a link across to Article 7.1 of the Northern Ireland Protocol, where it relates to the import of goods. I think, you know, from our point of view, we are very clear that we don't have any issue with that. If, if, if firms based in the Republic of Ireland can continue to tender for Northern Ireland public sector opportunities that are below threshold, that, that's fine. We, we're, we're all for competition. But the one thing that we are still struggling to completely establish is how exactly that works from, say, the Irish government's point of view and looking at under threshold procurement. Um, if we look, as, as Mark was alluding to, I mean, David, our David, members have seen. David, just a yeah. quick one. What, what's the threshold for uh, Irish public procurement under threshold? What's the definition of that? Is that 5 million euro? Yes, yeah, so so the thresholds are the same, are, are the same and it's just uh, that ours is four point seven billion sterling. Yeah, and also just to get me, I'm just sort of racking my brain going back here in, in the past with the uh, obviously with the the county managers and the rest of it have got much more uh, latitude and how they can uh, go out for procurement and the rest of it. So have we had any indication since the sort of the protocols come into place? that we haven't been able to get any bids or do we feel that there's been any changes? Uh, no, Chair, we, we, we haven't had any indication of that yet, but the, the, in effect, the, the, the framework around it, um, where we are, the UK has signed up to the WTO GPA membership, that in absolute terms only covers over threshold procurement. Under threshold procurement is no longer covered un, unless in the case of the protocol, there is a very particular impact relating to the cross-border test and the movement potentially of goods into Northern Ireland from an EU member state. And at that point, according to the interpretation that the Cabinet Office have of the protocol, you should therefore mean you should therefore enable those under threshold opportunities to be open to EU-based contractors, not just Northern Irish and UK-based contractors. Um, so that's effectively that that as we understand it though this is an external trade matter in terms of our members looking south of the border so over a course of a few months now we've been engaging with the department for the economy on this and uh, as of our last engagement with officials in dfe there has been a paper shared with the minister on potential options to look at this um but we're awaiting further developments um if we just turn back then briefly to the UK common framework on public procurement. Um, we very much support the continued maintenance of existing disputes approaches that stem from the remedies directives that have been incorporated into UK law. However, we'd be very keen to see the various UK authorities explore the addition of new tribunal-based approaches with the intent of reducing the amount of procurement and contractual disputes that end up in court. 
Um, and then finally, Chair, on I mean, it's sort of similar terminology, but what we would know is UK-wide procurement frameworks. Uh, recent years have seen a plethora of these emerge, such as SCAPE and Fusion 21. Um, while we do not question their legal status nor the benefits they can bring in getting projects speedily to the market and into delivery, their introduction and consequent applicability to any public sector client within the UK does for us raise questions around their oversight and accountability. Uh, significant amounts of public money are channeled through these frameworks and we are yet to see a mechanism by which this can be properly monitored. Mm -hmm. um, given how widely applicable they are, invariably are, we um, always make our members as aware of the opportunities as we can whenever they come up. However, it's a far from perfect approach and we believe a review of UK-wide frameworks, their applicability and accountability is in order. And that is something which the parties to this common framework should take forward. And we have welcomed the Cabinet Office's recent statement in that regard. So, Sir, thank you very much for your time. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Look, I think uh, the Concordat, as we expect it, do we think it's going to bring about material changes in public procurement in Northern Ireland? Big question. Um, I, I don't think it, it will. Um, I think what's important as far as our members are concerned is that they can, can still get access to the GB market as they have been able to over the last decade, decade and a half. Um, we, the Cabinet Office note that was published pre-Christmas, um, I mean, certainly since the time of the referendum in 2016, we have always heard rumblings of a number of local authorities, particularly in England, who want to make sure that construction contracts are to some extent restricted to very locally based suppliers. And yes, we can understand that. But at the same time, it doesn't really bode well for the future functioning of the UK's internal market. Um, and for our members, um, I mean, the GB market has been a massive area of growth over the last decade. Um, and if you were to have enhanced protectionism on these under threshold projects, um, I think the issue would be you'd find a lot of our members then looking back to Northern Ireland to grow its capital budget. And for all the reasons which you are very familiar, that's not something we see necessarily happening. So um, I, I, I don't think we foresee huge change, but we've got to be careful around some of these the potential barriers that are being erected. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Jim. Yeah. Could I take you back then to this issue of the cross-border <laughs> dimension of under threshold procurement? Where does that leave your members in contrast with similar operators in GB? Does that mean that you are subject to competition from the Republic that they're not going to be subject to? Yes, so, so that Cabinet Office note specifically states that for under threshold procurement that is taking place in Britain, mm -hmm. um, you can restrict it to the local authority that you're taking forward, but you can't exclude um, con contractors based on their, you can't exclude Northern Irish based contractors. Yes. However, for under threshold procurement within GB, that cabinet office note is very clear that you, you can now exclude non-UK headquartered firms. Um, where the protocol seems to have the impact for Northern Ireland is that you, you can't make that exclusion. Now, our view would be you know, we, we we're not particularly big fans of the exclusion in any shape or form. Um, but because of the cross-border test with relation to goods, um, if, a, if a contractor who's based in the Republic uh, can make a case that they would be bringing some level of goods across the border in order to deliver, say, um, a part of an education project, then that procurement should remain open to them. Um, th th that's our reading of what the Cabinet Office are saying. Um, but but, but your member, your member here in Northern Ireland, uh, tendering for something, uh, unlike 
his parallel person in GB is going to be subject potentially to competition from the Republic that the GB operator wouldn't be subject to. Is that it in a nutshell? If the, if the opportunity is in Northern Ireland, yes, you're correct. Now, how then does that work? Is there a quid pro quo in terms of you uh, being able to compete for Republic of Ireland tenders, or is it a one-way process? Uh, that's what we've been seeking clarification on, um, because, as we said earlier on, the, G the WTO GPA applies mm. to above threshold. So below threshold, strictly speaking, uh, the, the, the way it would have worked when we were members of the European Union, it doesn't apply in the same way for below threshold works. That being said, two months in, we're not aware of any of our members having been excluded from below threshold opportunities in the Republic. But you but haven't, you equally, haven't got clarity in that. No, because we most don't have clarity. It'd be most unfair to end up with your members subject to competition from the Republic but unable to compete in the Republic? Yes. Um, and just a, sort of an, a quick add-on to that before I bring Matthew in. Obviously, one of the questions here is that, um, and because we're in a fairly uh, litigated sort of place in Northern Ireland, everything seems to be put through some sort of JR or another to deal with something or another. One of the issues is going to be is that if a Republic of Ireland company decides that it has been excluded from a below threshold um, contract in local government or elsewise government procurement here in Northern Ireland. They're obviously going to they're obviously going to use the sort of the, the mechanisms that's laid out in the protocol, which would, could and may indeed add up with the role of the European Court of Justice to do those figures as well. Bearing in mind that there isn't a degree there isn't much clarity in this, mm. our Northern Ireland can companies now concerned that we're going to end up in a sort of a, an even another layer of sort of litigation that seems to be going back and forth in virtually every contract because if we're if we're saying in one sense that below thresholds we're looking to allow our sort of local businesses to compete and, and be able to uh, use that as an opportunity um, but are they going to end up in the sort of court every single time this is going to happen are there, there are there concerns about that or do you think that can be managed through I mean, you'd like to hope it would be managed through, but you know, strictly speaking, if, 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 say, for instance, Louth County Council was to take forward an under-threshold procurement opportunity today and was to look at the WTO GPA um, and determine that a Northern Irish headquartered construction firm was no longer wasn't wasn't covered by the schedules of the WTO GPA, then in theory at least they could exclude them. Um, we working with a, a, a legal firm, uh, and in this case it was Arthur Cox. You know they published a note in around Christmas and, and the New Year, which basically said, you know, it is possible that Republic of Ireland-based clients, be it central government or local government, could, strictly speaking look at an individual under threshold procurement and say well we don't have to include them now I, ideally we would not like that to be the case but there's no particular solid grounding right now for them including northern irish headquartered contractors mm. and under threshold procurements yeah, under the protocol, we have to do on the reciprocal side of it, and we don't want to get into a sort of a, a north-south dispute between various companies. And as you quite rightly pointed out, this is the last thing you want. But you know, tech, you know, they they would be able to, under the rules of the protocol, sort of a bid for uh, under threshold uh, here. That, that, that according to that cabinet office procurement policy note from the fifteenth of December, that is very clearly the interpretation. It doesn't apply in Great Britain, um, but it does apply here. And the, the direct correlation the Cabinet Office make is with Article 7.1 of the protocol. Okay. Matthew? Thank you. It sounds like what you're saying is there is a potential... Sorry, if, David, tell me if I'm unfairly summarising here, but there, your reading of not the protocol itself, but a Cabinet Office note interpreting the protocol is that under th is that there may be the possibility of um, 
is that Southern Republic based contractors uh, cannot be excluded from certain types of uh, procurement, uh, under threshold procurement in the North. But your advice from Arthur Cox is that the reciprocal clarity is not, it's not clear in the protocol that Northern Irish contractors, okay, it sounds like what you would like is, is you would have liked the protocol to be clearer that uh, mm. that procurement, in, that that bit of the, if you like, all island economy should be equal or there should be a degree of protection for Northern businesses in uh, seeking work south of the border. Would it, have you engaged with the um, Irish government on this? We've engaged with the Department for the Economy on this specifically as it's an, as it's an external trade matter and, and CPD are aware of our, of our thoughts on it as well in, in this regard, although, as I say, it's an external trade matter. Um, I, I think, you know, there has been some talk about some kind of a bilateral arrangement mm. between the UK and Ireland to resolve this particular point. Um, I'm not entirely sure how realistic that is, given that in the Republic, obviously, you, you remain under the EU's procurement regime, so I don't know how able you are to have a bilateral with a non-EU member state. Uh, um, but, I, I, you know, I think we, we don't want any exclusion. I mean, I think the competition on the island and vice versa, east-west, has been very healthy for our members. It's been very healthy in terms of things like innovation, productivity, um, seeing new kinds of delivery of construction, it, you know, all of those things which we just don't want to put at risk. And, and frankly, as well, in the current climate, and what we were talking about at the committee last week, with how a lot of our members are finding it a much, much more challenging market in Northern Ireland <coughs> due to the lack of new commercial opportunities, we are in a way kind of back in the same place where we maybe were a decade or so ago where Northern Ireland-based Northern Ireland contractors will be, in order to maintain their own stability, they'll be looking for opportunities outside of Northern Ireland again. Um, and, and any kind of risk around that um, is, is not something we want to see. Okay, so but if I'm summarising correctly, you haven't seen any... Um... There's no protocol related east-west disruption. It's a protocol related lacunae related to north-south opportunities and guarantee being absolutely clear that builder uh, contractors in Northern Ireland ha continue to have access, you know, or that there, there, there's no potential for distortion in terms of you're having access. Okay, so in, in, act, in a sense, that's that's interesting to clarify that just because it's it's a it, it is true that there's a lot there are a lot of stuff in the protocol where actually north-south the oil island economy, as it were, is not protected. And um, just on another uh, point, um, on, which is not to do with the protocol, it's to do with this. Uh, the, and your note says reserving contracts. That's about is so, um, this is about the reserve reserving procurement by supplier area. Is your concern there that um, uh, it says in scope organisations should not define by nations of the UK, i.e., England, Scotland, Wales, uh, Northern Ireland? Um, and where a county reservation is to apply to only a single county may be reserved. Is your concern there that, by definition, because of population size, if you are Greater Manchester Council, you define that, that, that there's just more, Northern Ireland is just likely, Northern Ireland uh, firms are more likely to be excluded because there's just not as many people here, so they're more likely to say you have to be from Greater Manchester or Yorkshire or whatever? Yeah, so, so that basically if you were to take a council, uh, and it, it's, it's different obviously in England because a lot of what our construction public spend here is say health and education works. In England, most of that is channeled through the local authorities. So for instance, a lot of our members would be very successful in say areas like the East Midlands, the different yeah. councils around there, Derbyshire, Nottinghamshire. So if you have a, a, a project coming forward, which is 4.7 million pounds or less, and you are Derbyshire County Council, then according to what the, the Cabinet Office, you know, flexibility they have now given you, you can say, I am entirely reserving this procurement opportunity to firms located within Derbyshire County Council. Um, it, 
so far we haven't been aware of it coming up on construction works, but it has come up on construction services on several procurements. Um, I think one of which might have been uh, Liverpool um, and, and actually the Greater Manchester Council, I think I saw as well. Um, and that, uh, you know, our members would have, so I can think of a number of our members that who would have bases in, say, the Midlands and, and different parts of England. Mm -hmm. But strictly speaking, according to the, the way the, the Cabinet Office interpretation runs, they would, as we read it, they would be excluded because they're not, headquartered there yeah and so is that so that's in the common framework so that's a new thing in the common framework that you can basically be uh you can play favorites with your contractors in east midlands or west of scotland or wherever it is and um, was that previously not allowed under eu law yeah no, so, so well under threshold procurement even under eu law always allowed say the devolved nation in our case yeah. to, to do things a bit differently but this is a very clear thing that the cabinet office have brought in yeah. since christmas for local authorities and I, I i think probably primarily geared towards predominantly local authorities in england yeah. um I mean, certainly in any of the engagement we've had with CPD and maybe Mark from, with the Procurement Board hat can reflect more on this. It, it, it isn't something that's been mentioned as something that anybody in, in government in Northern Ireland would do, yeah. you know, whereby you might be restricting something to a contractor from, Alpha. say, Causeway Coast and Glensburg Council. Yeah. So th this was, uh, but it's not clear, but it was, it seemed like EU law was, in a sense, protected Northern Ireland firms before that. Um, uh, but now uh, we aren't protected in that way. Yeah, I mean, for over threshold, it will remain as is, uh, but for be below threshold, there is now, through the Cabinet Office, this, this note whereby you can't exclude by local authority area. The EU wasn't as bad as all that. Yeah. Oh, it was. Worse. It was worse. worse. Oh, worse. <laughs> good riddance. No, I think the evidence has been interesting. I today. will allow you that. I will allow right. you that discretion. Pat. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Um, the threshold, what, I mean, what figure is that threshold? Are we talking 100,000, 500,000? 4.7. The threshold is 4.7 million for oh, works. Oh uh, there is a threshold for concerns, which is a lot lower. But in terms mm. of construction, it's 4.7 million. Okay, so the um, the construction employers, the federation, uh, the rules and the governance uh, for north south, um, it's open to competition. And it says that the department appears to indicate that Northern Ireland companies will have access to the Republic of Ireland procurement opportunities. Is that correct? I didn't hear what the reference was to the document at the start. Uh, it's, I'm just reading just off, off the other potential suppliers located in other EU member states, the uh, Construction Employers Federation. Therefore, have sought clarity on the rules that the government of the of the Republic would work in respect of public procurement. The department appears to indicate that Northern Ireland companies will have access to the Republic of Ireland procurement opportunities. Well, yeah, I mean, for over threshold, yes, that, that's that's very clearly laid out in the WTO GPA schedules. For under threshold, I, I, we, we just don't. We don't have the same level of certainty as we used to. Um, you, you can still have access to the opportunities, but whether some type of non-discrimination or, or discrimination approach is employed um, at this moment in time is it, perfectly it's, it's possible. I, I, was, I was reading it just the same because it says May, such as below the threshold conference, may still need to be opened up to competition. And um, suppose, uh, uh, what powers uh, would you like that the Northern Ireland Executive Assembly to gain? What extra powers? Is there a help of the Executive? Has extra powers? Can we combat that or look at that in any way? Is there extra powers that could be given to the Executive? 
Well, I, I think I think the strictly speaking, the, the only way you would you would absolutely resolve it is if you had some kind of bilateral arrangement between whether it's the UK government or the Irish government or potentially the Northern Ireland Executive and and the Irish government. I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure of, of the legalities of it, but you'd have an arrangement which said that explicitly a, a Northern Irish headquartered construction firm cannot be excluded from a below threshold public procurement opportunity on the Irish Republic. Mm-hmm. That that's what ultimately you would you would you would be looking for as a as a as a as a complete resolution. Now how do you get to that end point? As I said, DFE have, have had previous conversations with us. They have talked about some kind of bilateral arrangement, but I, I, you know that is still being fleshed, fleshed out as an option. I so. Okay, thanks. And Melissa? 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 Uh, so we can ask us. Oh. There we go. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah, uh, Chair, yeah, just as, as on the same vein, uh, I know just that earlier on when the question was asked of that you had any communication with uh, the Republic, you had said that you had talked to the Department of the Economy, but not directly probably with the uh, Republic themselves on the same issue. And uh, I'd have thought that, you know, uh, just even from uh, your own statement that for in the, this last five years, that Northern Irish firms um, uh, have been very, very successful in terms of, of, uh, of uh, securing work on that on the Republic itself. And that would have been uh, very much in the interest, uh, not only of the All Ireland economy, but even in particular the, uh, of the economy of the Republic, that uh, if they were, uh, if, if Northern Irish firms were securing those contracts quite clearly, then they're the most competitive uh, in that respect. And that, uh, if anything, one has um, has a fair lever there, and ensuring that that type of legislation is in place to facilitate that. And I don't think you know that it's a case of the UK and uh, Europe uh, resolving an issue there at a, a UK-wide um, uh, sort of resolution, but it's more specific and unique to the position that we now find ourselves in, in the north of Ireland. Uh, that whereby it quite possibly is one of the issues that may be dealt with under the protocol and the likes of it. Would you uh, agree? Yeah, no, look, I mean, it, I mean, listen, the, the engagement we have had with the Department for the Economy is, has, been, has been much along that, that vein. It's effectively what, what if, if you need to find an arrangement that, that, that resolves this without there being any potential risk to exclusion, that, that it's, it's effectively what, 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 what that is because you still have this arrangement whereby the Republic of Ireland is still you know, within the European Union, obviously, and, and operates under the, their procurement approach, whereas we... Uh, yeah. Procurement, there's elements of it, obviously, which are devolved, but that we're still really operating under the UK's approach. So it's it's it's, and then when you add the protocol into the middle of that, it's how you, it's how you resolve. It's, it's what's the best route to resolve it, to take that issue out of the equation, so that, as you say, that our members can continue to win and tender for work in the south as much as they have been over the last five years. I mean, we've noticed a massive upsurge in our members winning work in the south, particularly in around social housing and things like that, which has been a, been a massive growth and a much needed growth in the south over the last over the last five years. And that's that's something we want to see continue in, in much the same way as we want to see firms headquartered in the south be able to tender for work up here. Yeah. Because it it, 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 it works in everybody's interests. Um, <laughs> You know, that, and, and, and as well, East West. There's no, you know, competition should not be seen as some kind of problem. It should be it should be widely and openly accepted by all. But unfortunately, it's one of the barriers that has been instigated now as a result of uh, the UK leaving the European Union. That of course you're going to have uh, restrictions there. Uh, but that again, to I just. Uh, 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 re-emphasise the point that we in the north of Ireland find ourselves in that unique situation that we're by hopefully it'll be resolved. It's the advantage of all the people here on this island. Mm. You finished, Melissa? 
Yeah, thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Uh, sir, Jim, you want to come in for a Just one, one quick question. Uh, you explained to us very clearly that there isn't any issue on over threshold. Uh, mm. the, the problem is in relation to under threshold. Just explain to us, in the scale of things, uh, to your members, how important is under threshold? Obviously, there are lesser contracts, but cumulatively, how do they compare with the over threshold? I think. For, for our members who are looking to the south for yes. public sector opportunities, you probably would find under threshold is, is, is more of where the market is. Right. When we look to Britain, it, it's probably the reverse. It's, it's over threshold. That's obviously to, to do with you know, island moving around from one, one, from one island to the other. Um, so we are not, probably not as concerned about what the cabinet office are saying in England for under threshold works, yeah. Um, but equally, any it doesn't help, you know, because what you'll find is contractors of ours who will say have bases. Once they have a well established base and say somewhere like the East Midlands, they will start to almost operate like a firm that is based in the East Midlands. They will they will start looking for other opportunities there which are not 15 20 million pound projects which may be two three million pound projects um I, I, I'm, I'm you know i go back to the point where in the market we're in right now putting in any kind of potential cur curtailments around opportunities it's, it's 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 just not going to be helpful we can already see i think we saw in the official data between January and February, the number of construction workers that were furloughed went up 15% mm. in one month. Uh, we, in the evidence of the committee last week, talked about what was starting to happen in terms of turnover and profit margins. Um, so, you know, we can already see problems coming, and, and now is not the time to cut back on people's opportunities to win new work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you very much indeed. <coughs> Mark, David, as usual, thank you very much indeed. And thank you very much indeed for your giving your evidence. And just, uh, just before you go, I think just to get approval of the committee, I think we should be right to the Department of the Finance uh, asking for clarity for fair access for Northern Ireland firms. Um, also asking, seeking clarity on North-South access and also whether they have had visibility of the Arthur Cox note, because I think that's quite an interesting uh, uh, piece of information. And again, further clarity on GB access and also the Cabinet Office note as well, if we are content. Are we content? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thanks very much indeed. Cheers, Cheers, Mark. Cheers, David. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda, team, is uh, subordinate legislation, the Energy Performance of Buildings, Certificates and Inspections Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Can I ask Billy and John Salters to come in, please? Hi, Billy. Hi, John. Hi. Can you hear us okay? Hello, Chair. Yes. Excellent. Okay. I just wanted to say that this uh, session will be reported by Hansard. Our clerk's briefing notes at page 212, and the Department of Finance SL1 is at page 214. Uh, Billy or John, I don't know who's making the opening statement, but uh, we're, we'd be delighted to hear from you. Hello, Chair. Uh, Billy Black here. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah, so Chair, I'll make uh, the opening statement. So um, I'm Billy Black from the Department's Building Standards Branch. I have with me my colleague, uh, John Salters, who's um, head of the Legislation and uh, Energy Unit and is responsible for the administration work on this particular amendment. So uh, we'll just give you a bit of the background um, to this, um, and then um, obviously we'll answer any questions that you have. So the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive and EU Directive back in 2002 um, was set and its main um, purpose was to promote energy efficiency of buildings through cost effective measures. It was recast in 2010 and further amended in 2018. The um, deal with certificates. 
these were transposed in um, a, a number of um, uh, statutory rules here um, from 2008, um, and the last one was, um, I think, 2019, which uh, set um, fees for um, lodgement of these EPCs um, onto the um, Northern Ireland Register, which is a common register maintained by the Ministry of Housing. Thanks, um, our communities and housing and local government at, at Westminster. Um, so um, these energy performance certificates um, are generally required whenever a building is constructed or when a building is placed for sale or rent. Um, and um, therefore they generally form part of a conveyancing process and um, are needed for conveyancing to uh, proceed. Um, I suppose you could describe them in, in layman's terms. If you've ever been to Curry's and, and bought uh, some white goods, you would have seen a, an energy label on the, um, the uh, appliance, and it would have maybe A plus A plus plus down into an F. And it's a similar rating system that you used for um, the energy performance certificate provides a similar rating system for buildings um, and for houses. So if you're wanting to buy a property, it gives you the opportunity to check out what the um, uh, energy efficiency of that, that um, uh, building or, or um, uh, house is to, so that you can make an informed decision. Um, that provides some background. Um, to um, how we arrived at this. Um, what we are now proposing to do is to amend the fee that were last amended in 2018-19, and the proposed fees um, are going to be reduced. So they're going to be reduced for domestic uh, premises from 186 to 164, and for uh, non-domestic premises from £9.84 to £1.89. And these charges are usually levied um, as part of the provision of a certificate by an energy assessor. So, Chair, um, over to you for, for questions. Okay. Thanks very much indeed. And thanks very much indeed, Billy. Uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, the proposed statutory ref rule refers to energy performance certificates for domestic and non-domestic properties, as well as display energy certificates and air conditioning inspection reports. If we have understood you correctly, the EPCs are available to potential buyers and tenants are an, and are enforced by the uh, local councils. Is that correct? That is correct. The local councils um, will enforce. Um, they will visit um, estate agents to check that um, the certificates are being displayed on sale or rent. Um, and obviously, whenever a new build application comes into the council, they'll check it then, um, and they can issue PCM notices um, um, if they find out any breaches of the uh, legislation. Do we know if they have ever enforced any of these? They have. Um, um, although we're we're under the um, understand sometimes it can be reluctant. Um, the councillors um, in, in some areas are reluctant, possibly, to issue a PCM against a, a local estate agent. Okay. Um, why is this proposed rule by affirmative resolution? Um, it um, originally was um, made under Section 2.2, parts uh, um, of, of the uh, European Communities Act, um, and of course that fell um, on exit day, um, and it was made under under the negative resolution procedure in the Assembly, um, but as um, we, we the EU um, at the end of the transition period, the Section 2 powers fall. However, under the Withdrawal Act, um, there were clauses put in there to uh, save um, uh, uh, changes and amendments to fees, etc. Um, and um, that's why we have to use um, th that, uh, which is a slightly different procedure. Um, John knows more about that technical. If you'd want to come in there, John, and speak about that procedure. Yes, Chair. Um, so, Schedule 4 of the European Withdrawal uh, 2018 gives uh, the Department the primary powers to amend existing uh, fees. Uh, in legislation derived from uh, EU directives, etc. 
um, but we must follow the procedure that was set down in Schedule 7, um, I think it's paragraph 12.3, which means that we must follow the draft affirmative process. Um, as this is the first time if the department's going through and using these powers, it was, it was a, not a, a, sh a shock, but quite a surprise to see that we had to, to go down this, this particular route. But that's the powers that have been granted to us and the procedure we must follow as per the, the Withdrawal Act. So basically we're saying because there's a change in the fees, because we want to amend the fees structure or there's been a change in the fees structure, we have to follow the European Directive. I don't, am, I, am I getting this right? No. Sorry, Chair. We have to follow the European Union Withdrawal Act. The procedures laid down there in Schedule 7. Um, we have the powers to amend the fees in our own domestic legislation under yeah. Schedule 4. Four of the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. So it's 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 not a it's not an EU matter. It's it's very much what was uh, the powers that were granted to us under the, the Withdrawal Act back in 2018. Right. So this is from this is our legislation. It's from our ministry to do dealing with our EPCs. In our yes. discretion. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, yes. I've got that. Okay. Um, so, just a final question. Um, if Northern Ireland deviates from the rest of the UK in respect to EPCs as a consequence of the Northern Ireland Protocol, where's that going to leave us? Um, well, I'll take that one. The, the EPCs, uh, the, uh, the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive is not covered under the Protocol. So, we don't have, there's, there's no following of the Protocol as regards. Uh, the, the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, it sits outside. But even though I think environmental issues are covered within the protocol? But that's the case, Chair. We have, have, we have been advised that this sits outside the, the Northern Ireland Protocol. Right. So energy performance it, it doesn't sit, isn't, isn't classified under environmental issues or environmental regulations? No. Buildings don't move across borders generally, so... Well, you'd be surprised. The products. <laughs> That's a disappointment to think that aren't in the protocol I'm noticing today. <laughs> okay, Jim. Um, I'm actually buying a house at the moment, and I perceive this to be a wasteful bureaucratic nonsense because I have never. You didn't make a declaration of interest at the beginning of that. I, I wish to. <laughs> <laughs> make I wish a declaration to... of interest, and then you can say what you like, Jim. I wish, <laughs> I wish to declare an interest that I'm buying a house at the moment. Okay, feel free. Uh, I perceive this to be a wasteful load of nonsense because the reality is that nobody buying a house pays the blind bit of notice to these certificates. They seem to be creating bureaucracy and employing people coming around to state the obvious. Energy conservation in buildings is naturally improving to make the houses more attractive to potential buyers, and it has improved dramatically in recent years. That's through the building regulations rather than the energy certificates. Why are we continuing to impose this yet another layer of bureaucracy on house purchase, which is one of the main generators of the economy? Um, I'll um, answer that, sir. Um, Yes, well, um, <laughs> uh, energy performance certificates um, in, in GEB um, have been tended um, to um, uh, link into some of the policy interventions they've had, had there in terms of, for instance, the Green Deal, um, which was, you know, um, about granting um, um, uh, monies or loans to uh, people who wanted to um, upgrade their properties, etc. The certificates do show on them um, some um, examples of how your house, for instance, could, could be upgraded. Um, also, in England um, and Wales, I think, um, they have the minimum energy uh, performance um, standards or MEES. Um, and what that relates to is that landlords who wish to rent properties have to provide. Um, a property which has a minimum EPC of um, C, a C rating. Uh, that um, is being, I think, the Department for Community here, but uh, similar 
having haven't, haven't been introduced here, but um, other people regard the EPC um, as a core um, to you know moving towards um, um, uh, low uh, carbon um, uh, footprint, you know, by two. 2050, so that um, it forms a fundamental basis of uh, policy interventions um, in terms of, for instance, a renovation strategy or a strategy to improve the energy efficiency of the existing building stock. Yeah, and if uh, they always say houses are sold in location, 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 uh, seldom if ever in a brochure is it sold on the basis of its energy performance and of course energy performance is increasing significantly as a result of amendments to the building control regulations that's that's where it's really that's where the real action is uh, as standards are, are increased as a result of that but none of that none of what you've said actually supports the need to have someone come out fill in a form and issue a certificate i mean that's just bureaucratic and is any of this leading to an improvement in energy conservation in our community, which would not have happened anyhow as a result of building control regulation changes? Well, um, building control or uh, building regulations um, at the minute, um, we're looking at um, uplifts to, use, um, to the building regulations. But they tend to be for, um, or the majority um, of increased tends to be for uh, situation where you have a new build um, and in a new build situation you're actually adding to the, the building um, stock so effectively you are increasing increasing the footprint so the footprint in the province in the province increases every time you put a new build because you're not not necessarily doing away with an older building the vast majority of energy um, um, comes from existing buildings so while um, the building regulations can address um, to a certain extent new build and it can decrease, decrease the rate of increase of uh, energy use, um, you really need to uh, introduce measures um, around your existing, uh, the existing uh, environment. Um, and it may become more important as we move forward that people will take more of an interest in um, what the energy rating of, of um, their house may be. Does anybody pay any attention to the certificate? Have you ever heard of a house sale falling through or anyone t changing their behaviour because of a piece of paper which they've had to pay for? never met my mum. <laughs> no, really is it working? Because as I say, we've had these now for quite a few years and they don't seem to be having any impact whatsoever apart from adding another layer of bureaucracy to convincing. Uh, and you know what? What are we yeah. actually achieving? And if, if Northern Ireland PLC decided to drop this layer of bureaucracy, would it make a hip of difference? Chair, I think it gives is the consumer as well the ability to make informed decisions as a, as as an outcome of the recommendation report. So the the EPC, yes. Energy, the, the carbon emissions of, of a property, but it also directs the, the homeowner or, or the landlord or relevant person in towards those modifications they can make, starting at low cost to high cost. They actually lower their own energy costs. So there, there is a level, um, Chair, um, Mr. Wells says about bureaucracy, but it actually has an impact on, on consumers out right there that they, they can then make informed decisions based on recommendations from accredited energy assessors. Or the person selling the house said, I have installed cavity wall insulation. I mean, that's how simple it is. The, the, the seller of the property can actually refer to it. He doesn't that's need a certificate. Correct. He doesn't have to pay for someone to come out and do that. He can just put on, I've got solar panels, cavity wall insulation, and I've got six inch um, uh, insulation in my loft. That's all that's required, not a formal process of having to go through every property, having to go through this bureaucracy. I have to disagree okay. with Mr sure. Wells. So, just, just through the chair. Yes, that's me. Okay, thank you, thank you. I just have to disagree, Jim, with, with Mr Wells, because this is a third party that's going out and inspecting the house. And they're looking at, and looking at the loft insulation, whether it's up to regulations or below regulations. On top of that, they look at the boilers 
and they assert the boilers. It's not correct. There are different levels of boilers, those that are more efficient. And over it all, we want a cleaner environment. And it's a proof that if you have a new, modern boiler installed, I believe you would get a much higher uh, EPC. I'll tell you what. I don't know about the EPC, but the MLAPC, that, that would be a good one to bring in as well, because I do think the EPCs do work, and I think that people will look at them, because if you're buying an old, drafty house, and you're coming into that, in order to bring it up to standards, you're going to have to spend twenty or £30,000. I tell you, you'd look at your EPC then, and it would surely help sell the house. It wouldn't my point, anyhow. Okay. Finish, Pat? Thanks. Paul? Yes, thank you, uh, and thanks for your presentation. I suppose my question is not about the, the merit or the worth of these certificates, because I understand it's information, and I'm, it's information flow, and that can be useful, uh, uh, and add confidence as opposed to a seal. Uh, and it probably also provides local authorities with information about the, the state of housing stock. My, my question is more about the industrial, industrial charge. Uh, a massive, uh, massive difference between a domestic charge and what was a non-domestic charge. And you have to remember, businesses, businesses, especially heavy industrial users, spend well over the odds for their energy in the first place. So they are very much uh, energy efficient. Uh, if if they're not, then they do usually tend to exist that long. So uh, why was there such a disparity between the domestic charge and the non-domestic charge in the first place? Chair, um, the, the difference was based on the, the architecture of the old uh, Northern Ireland EBC register. Uh, in September of last year, we moved to a new cloud-based register maintained by MHCLG, as, as Billy indicated. Prior to that, we were part of a concessionary contract by a, a, uh, with a company, um, and they started back in 2007 when the wheels we were in 2008. So as uh, the requirements of EPCs and data that needed to be put on to that chain, um, obviously, a difference between the data collected for non-domestic and domestic, and it was just because of that change, because of the differences in the architecture involved in the systems. There was a system. Uh, there was a difference in the in the costs. So there was never profit made on on this. It was pretty much the user pays 100% cost recovery. But because it cost more to maintain the non-domestic register in the past, that's why there was a greater cost to the non-domestic Okay, so uh, for, an, for an, uh, a non-domestic uh, facility or, or place, uh, is, do you need multiple certificates for areas or will the one certificate do you but it's just the, the amount of information that's on it and then also the size and scale of the property? It was, we, I don't, I don't want to get down the rabbit hole of, of multi, uh, multi building sites um, or multi campus sites, but in terms of non domestic, there was, it's, it was a, it's a different procedure. Um, it's a diff different assessment. A energy assessor for a non domestic um, situation has different qualifications and accreditations than, than one that would be. Um, assessing dwellings, so there, there's different costs there, and it's a different procedure. Okay, having said that, and I, and I get the point you make about you know, contractual arrangements and, and uh, responsibilities placed upon uh, the parties, but then how how do we how could, how have we got to a point where we can improve so much that the there's an eighty one percent decrease in the non domestic certificate? <laughs> Moving to the more modern, sorry, chair. Uh, moving to the more modern way of doing it, the cloud-based based architecture, it was it uh, cuts the cost considerably. And I know we're only talking pence here, but what's the justification for 
What's the justification for having non-domestic at 1.89 and domestic at 1.64? 25p a difference, I know, but but what's why why the difference now if it's cloud based? That, that's basically sorry, chair. That's basically the outcome of the modelling uh, that has been carried out by MFCLG to make sure that there there is no element of taxation that we're we're the it's a cost neutral service. So. If we were to make them even, it would be a subsidy being paid by domestic users on non-domestic. All ah, right, okay. Uh, we know all about that when it comes the other way, by the way, with regards to energy bills. Uh, so can I ask then, if it's, if it's a not-for-profit uh, procedure, uh, when should this have been changed? And then... That begs the question, for how long have we been charging £9.84 when it's not required to have the £9.84? That £9.84, Chair, was, uh, is from 2018. The costs were reviewed on, a, on a, an annual uh, basis to ensure that there was no overcharging taking place. As I say, this, is, this new uh, register came in September of this year, it, uh, we, we required the, the necessary modelling to make sure that whenever we did uh, bring in the, the new fees, that they were uh, set at the correct level for both domestic and non-domestic, uh, so, as well as aircon and as well as the display energy certificates as well. So not not to cause alarm in any shape or form, but but are we saying then that since September, businesses have been overcharged for this service? Chair, businesses charge this directly. Um, a business will pay an energy assessor to carry out the assessment. It's the energy assessor who is then paying the lodgement fee. So this, the, 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 the lodgement fee is being paid through the accreditation body by the, the energy assessor. And we have been um, through a, a regular meetings with MSC LG energy assessors and the accreditation schemes we've been liaising with them on this issue. So, so in, in effect then the business has to employ the assessor to do the assessment who then applies for the certificate so it's that fee that the assessor pays but of course the assessor will be employed by the, the business and will be, be able to uh, uh, will be able to charge uh, a much more substantial amount is not that correct? That's correct. Um, do, do we know what the average do we know what the average rate of an assessor would be for business, or does that depend on size and scale? Well, uh, uh, an EPC an EPC for a drawing um, would cost around around an average of uh, fifty to sixty pounds. So um, the um, the part of that that would be the fee would be one. And 64, um, which is what um, uh, uh, less about two or three percent um, of the actual charge for the EPC um, for um, uh, a non-domestic uh, building. The EPC cost would be obviously a lot higher than uh, 50 pounds. I just don't have a typical um, cost um, on the top of my head unless John, you have. No, Chair, I wouldn't have that. It, it, it would depend, as, as uh, Mr. Free suggested, on the, the type of the building. Um, it would be very, be very variable, depending on the complexity. You know, that is a level five um, inspection taking place. Okay. Okay. Th thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Tim. Any further? Okay, Billy. Thank you, John. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can we remove both Billy and John from the spotlight, please? Are there any actions which members would wish to take forward on this particular piece of the SL1? And therefore, if that is the case, uh, if the committee is content, there is no objection to the related policy, that it is also content for the department to make the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Okay. Any against? 
Agreed. I had my rant, that's what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> we know you had rant. I'm about to pay the bill. Yeah, I know. But Jim, Jim, buying a house with eight bedrooms isn't that <laughs> energy efficient. <laughs> I'm just advising that. Just close the windows, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> okay, team, let's crack on. Uh, item number 10, correspondence. Uh, just first of all, correspondence index. Members are asked to note the index of correspondence on page 222. Uh, 10.2 Department of Finance Legal Complaints and Regulations Northern Ireland Act 2016. Members are asked to note a response to the committee at page 225 indicating it will bring forward secondary legislation in 2021 which establishes the role of a legal services oversight commissioner. Are we content to note? Oh. Note agreed. Department of Finance, Banking Sector and other financial services. Members are asked to note a response to the committee on page 227 indicating that the Department's work with Treasury, banking sector and other financial providers is largely in relation to EU exit. Are we content to note? Uh, chair, page Go ahead, Jim. Two, the last page of that letter, page 228. 228. Hold on. It says, I'm almost midway down it, following this on the 10th of December 2020, the British Government announced to further £400 million in funding for the North, wherever that is, under the protocol. What was, can someone remind me, what was the 400 million in funding under the protocol? Sorry, what was that page number again, Jim? It's 228. 228, second paragraph at the bottom. I think that's about the Last sentence of the second paragraph, yeah. There's been so much announcements of funding, I've forgotten what that 400 million was under the protocol. The protocol? Yeah. Matthew? Uh, I don't know. Uh, is the, uh, it's a reasonable question. Can we ask that question? Can we go to the Dale and find out to get some more details I mean, on that? There, 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 is a, there has been a general, there have been EU exit costs, including around protocol, you know, port CUB, stuff. It's but I, will, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure if that is, if the SEUB would count as being uh, under the protocol. So Jim asked a fair enough question. Uh, it, it's not clear what that 400 million uh, is uh, in relation to, whether it's staff or what else. If I may, I don't know if Jim said, I had a, qu a question I wanted to ask, or I just wanted to make a point actually on the, uh, given we're asking for more detail on that, I think the, the, the paragraphs on the banking sector are pretty boilerplate. Yeah, well, sorry, I was going to mention that. It's sort of, yes, we are having meetings. Thank you. Move on. I just think it would be helpful to ask a little bit what those meetings are about and specifically what the concerns are. Yeah. Because they're, it's quite. And I also think, sir, I know Pat, you've got a particular interest in sort of the banking sector as, as we do, but you particularly as chair of the APG on banking. But the other issue is we'll have noted probably with, again, concern with issues to do with. Uh, Sort of Bank of Ireland, Ulster Bank, other issues to do with that as well, and there are indeed some concerns I think that would be there. So it might be worth, again, if we're content to write for, to communicate further with the department, get some more details about what they actually are discussing, rather than, as you quite rightly say, Matthew, a boilerplate sort of answer. Are we content? Okay. Uh, moving on to uh, next item of correspondence: uh, building cladding intervention. Uh, members are asked to consider the response at page 230 relating to the payment loan scheme for leaseholders announced by the House and Secretary the 10th of February 2021 uh, refers to England only. There will be there will be Barnet consequentials. The new property tax will be UK wide. The levy on new, on new construction will be in England only. You will note the Minister also advises that he submitted a, submitted a paper to the Executive recommending a building safety programme and supporting fund. You'll also note the words as a matter of urgency. So that the Northern Ireland citizens are afforded the same level of fire protection as other devolved administrations. I, you know, I, I do welcome the fact that the Minister sees that this is an area of concern and urgency as well. But it also, if um, members will also wish to note that AQWs appear to indicate that the building regulations and associated changes to the guidance booklet regarding fire prevention and cladding are not going to be brought forward in this mandate. So there seems to be a discrepancy between the urgency, which I think, having heard what we have heard during the evidence sessions we have had, particularly on fire safety regulations and cladding, and we probably do believe there is a degree of urgency on it, which the Minister has recognised, but the fact that they are not looking to bring forward changes to the guidance booklet until the next mandate, I think we would probably need to seek clarity in that. 
from the minister, if we were agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, on that letter, just the fourth paragraph, it says the levy will be an England only levy, and it will be for the executive to consider the need for a similar levy here. That would be a Department of Finance decision, mm -hmm. proposition. Which may be too soon to know, but I think I'd like to know is the minister minded for a levy here? And Again, that's a valid question. Where would that take us? Imagine that would be at the Commission, Chairperson. Mm. Yeah. Will do. Is that agreed? Yeah, agreed. And again, uh, just sort of going through that and sort of one of the issues that raised it. There was also this question of when the minister is looking at sort of fire safety regulations and are you referred to and compared to the other nations, and I think he was talking specifically, or the other devolved administrations, I think he was referring particularly to Scotland and Wales. But as we have seen from our evidence, there is a considerable difference between um, Scotland and England and Wales' approach on sort of fire safety regulations. So again, that's something else that we might be indicative of us keeping an eye on. Uh, if we'd like to move on to the next item, it's Building Control Northern Ireland Fire Safety Compliance. Members are asked to consider a response at page 233 from Building Control Northern Ireland providing details of suggested changes to building control legislation or statutory guidance to improve compliance with fire safety regulations. Building Control NI refers to the need for clarity around the use of sprinklers, escape routes and calls for um, an increase in fees in order to support enforcement. Are you content for us to forward to this, uh, this response to the Department for commentary? Great. Content. Uh, moving on to item 10.6 and 10.9, COVID business support schemes. Members are asked to note responses on page 241, 244, 247 and 258 regarding COVID-19 business support schemes from the Department of Finance and the Economy and the Committee for the Economy. The Department for the Economy provides a detailed list of schemes at page 249. Um, I don't know about you, but that's the first time I've actually seen in one place a list of all the schemes that have been produced right from the beginning and all the way through. And I think that's quite a valuable, I think it's an Annex A, and I know you're looking at that now, Matthew. Yeah. Um, it, to me, it was the first time, and I've spent a lot of time hunting this stuff out to try and produce graphics and things like that to produce for my team and also to any of the sort of the numerous constituencies that have been ringing me. That's the first time I've seen that in one place. <laughs> Uh, I think I would just like your uh, consideration if we'd circulate that to uh, the other committees and also indeed to other MLAs because I think it's a very mm -hmm. useful uh, it's a very useful explanation. Mm -hmm. yeah, I agree with that, Jeffrey. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it is it is useful. I'm glad they sent it to us. I would just one comment is um, uh, straightforwardly without any side. It is a, a useful um, it's a useful table. It, two things it doesn't have. Well, two things. It, it doesn't com completely differentiate between schemes which are um, open access to either the public. You know, very few of them are to everybody. But uh, although the high street scheme was going to be, yeah, um, uh, for all, but you know, open access to relevant sectors versus some of them are spending interventions, spending measures that were. Uh, you know, directed by the department to either individual institutions or sectors that weren't, they weren't grant schemes that involved applications. If you see what I mean, they're just spending measures done by the department. I'm not saying the department shouldn't include them in this table, but it would be perhaps helpful to have them uh, disaggregated by um, uh, schemes that were, you know, um, funding awards that were made by the department, um, uh, you know, if you like, in-house or things that involved uh, application. Or grant. Does, that, does that make sense? Yeah. Am I being un unreasonable? Yeah, sure. I'm not saying that to be um, to be uh, facetious. It's just, but then the other point is, it would be helpful to know what the and it might not. It might be that we wait until we're further down the line in this uh, to understand what the what the take up was on individual. Measures. Just just before Paul comes in. No, the reason I was particularly looking at that is a lot of people aren't fully aware of what was available and indeed yeah. and discussions really with, useful. within some officials who because I don't think there's a degree of clarity across the whole of government about what is available or is not. And I think that as just as a ready reckoner for MLAs to see now. And then we can ask the we can write to the Department of Economy for more 
get for more detail on yeah. that for the that other, desegregation of it. The other thing, and this is obviously, there's some of this will be on NI Business Info and the Invest NI website, but is a kind of, is the department satisfied that this is, that there's enough information about sort of what is live, like what's 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 red, what's still, yeah. if, you're, if you're still a way to support. But I think they, the, and again, just to sort of close this one out before I ask Paul to come in, the interesting bit is it's, it's triggered me to ask some questions that I didn't even realise, I, I, I wasn't fully aware of. And I thought I was reasonably over a lot of the detail. If you're going to make an application, Chair, I suggest you declare an interest now. <laughs> I don't think so. There's not much sense of me making an application, Paul. Yeah, it's easily missed, but in in the February 3rd pack, there is a similar uh, chart. Uh, now, that's information only correct up to 27th of January, so it is yep. dated. But that also adds information about the number of businesses benefiting, and also, as Matthew's alluded to, the dates. Uh, for reopening and closing and everything else. So that's very, in fact, the only reason my notes there is because I've used it since. It's been very, very handy for me. Uh, and it's similar to what we've been receiving today in this pack, although there's, it's formatted in a different shape, but that pack from, and again, with these devices now, you'll be able to look it up, but it's the third, February the third uh, finance committee pack and page 188 of that pack has that outlined, which is very, very useful. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Move on to the next item as 1010 Minister of Finance Sports Sustainability Fund. Members are asked to note a response at page 259 to the Committee for Communities regarding support for sports clubs and the Sports Sustainability Fund and local restrictions to sports scheme. The Minister refers to an ongoing reconsideration process for unsuccessful applicants to the LRSS. Are we content to note? Anybody wish to make any comments? Yeah. Great. Uh, next, uh, Minister of Finance, Establishment and Fiscal Council. Members are asked to note at page 260 and updated on the Fiscal Council Fiscal Commission. The information has previously been shared with the committee. It is understood that the relevant papers may not yet have been considered at the executive. Are we content to note? Great. Uh, Department of Finance, Census 2021, letter to MLAs. Members are asked to note at page 263 a copy of letters sent to all MLAs inviting them to information session sessions on the upcoming census. The committee will receive a briefing by NISRA after Easter on the progress of the data collection and analysis process. Are we content to note? Okay. No Department for Finance Public Service Pensions Policy. Members are asked to consider correspondence at page 264 on changes to public service pension policy in line with the McLeod judgment. The Department advises that a legislative consent motion will come before the Assembly shortly in order to address the age discrimination issues. Officials are scheduled to brief the Committee at next week's meeting, 10th of March, on this subject. Um, looking at the supplementary estimates, or trying to find out the supplementary estimates, obviously um, one of the big questions about the sort of McLeod settlement is likely to be the quantum and the size of it. I just thought the, the committee would be content to commission Ray's to produce a briefing note on the McLeod judgment and the LCM and to seek an oral briefing from the public sector unions on this matter, because obviously that would be quite in interesting. Jim? Yeah, first of all, um, I'm the chair of the Assembly Members Pension Fund, and obviously we uh, are very much affected by this decision, as well as public sector pensions generally, and indeed everybody in this room technically should de declare an interest because you're all... I assume members of, of the pension scheme. Um, what we're being told here is that the department have decided to go down the legislative consent motion route. Now that binds us then, of course, inextricably, inextricably to the UK-wide decision on this and gives us no discretion whatsoever. Now we have been lobbied by a lot of members of the police, police service of Northern Ireland who are very annoyed about this decision. The difficulty is uh, you're asking, Mr. Chair, about the, um, the funding of this. I think if we step outside the legislative consent motion, then we're going to end up picking up the tab. And the last figure I heard was 300 million mm. uh, to meet this, because this is doctors, consultants, it's nurses, it's firemen, it's Everyone. civil servants, it's everybody um, uh, who, who, were, who were, because they were too young, were taken out of final salary schemes in 2015. Yep. Uh, they will be put back until the end of March 2022. And I assume implicit in that is that the government are prepared, if we agree to the legislative consent motion, to pay the bill. If we don't, and we decide to let people con continue on beyond 2022, 
then I think it's absolutely clear that we'd have to pay the bill to allow people to stay in final salary schemes. And I think that would put us in a very difficult position. Um, and I think we're stuck with it, but it's going to cause a huge annoyance to particularly those in the police who were forced out mm -hmm. of their final salary scheme and who made a commitment to the police force on the basis that they were going to get that. Because let's be honest about it, a final salary scheme is a very, very important element of anyone's job contract and extremely valuable and also extremely expensive for the state mm -hmm. to uh, pay. So what I'd like Ray's to do is to tie down are the Treasury going to pay the extra money to us to do this? Now, if they say no, then that's different because they we're on our own and we can make our own decision. But if they say yes, then I don't think of any other option here and it's going to offend a lot of people. Okay. I think that's uh, opposite. Any other comments? Uh, so, Jim, while are police officers particularly affected? I could advise the whole sector. Well, the police officer's pension is a particularly good one. Um, mm. You know, it's, it's because um, it's a shorter level of service normally. It's a very good uh, pension, and therefore the economic loss to a, pres a, pl a police officer in this situation is significant. Also, they argue that it's a dangerous job. They went into it knowing there were risks involved, and one of the attractions was the very strong pension scheme that they had. Um, and the only sector that has actually written to me about that has been police officers, mm. nobody else. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just can we also see written briefings from the teaching and other health unions? And maybe a written briefing again. We've had a written briefing. Uh, uh, no, have we actually received a written briefing? No, we've only uh, received from individual uh, police officers, but the police federation may have a view on this. Mm. Police federation. Police federation as well. Yeah. Yeah. So do you um, want to take oral evidence from the Police Federation? Um, well, it, or yeah, at least must, written evidence. Yeah, I must say, I've had complaints from individual police officers yes. yeah. that, the fed, that the Federation hasn't taken a stand in this because they had agreed with their counterparts in GB to go with it. And the individual officers are left. Well, let's, let's, say, let's, say, let's seek a written briefing anyhow from the Police Federation and see what they say. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in the same position as Jim. I've had yeah. representation from people who uh, are not on the same page as the Police Federation on these yeah. issues. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Are we agreed? Agreed. Uh, Committee for Justice call for evidence. Uh, members are asked to consider page 267 correspondence from the Committee for Justice, including a call for evidence in relation to the protection from stocking bill. Are we content to note? No. Noted. Department of Finance monthly outturn and forecast out outturn. Members are asked to consider correspondence page 268 from the Department of Finance asking that the monthly outturn and forecast outturn information for January 2021. I'm just going to ask that the committee is content to forward this to raise for analysis and write to the department and seek clarity on the question of capital surges in March. It seems to be a bit of. Um, uh, obviously, they seem to be very good at paying their bills in, in March, obviously at the end of the financial year when they've got money ahead of them. Uh, but it might be just worthwhile, bearing in mind we're trying to look at how we can even out some of this, this approach and how we get to it. But we can do that as well. Are we agreed? Agreed. Uh, audit Committee draft budgets. Uh, members are asked to note at page 297 a short report sent to the Minister of Finance regarding draft budget 21-22 for the NIAO, NIPSO and the Assembly Commission. The Audit Committee appears to be accepting these organisations' draft budgets. Are we content to end note? Content. Great. Uh, Committee for the Economy, NICS Apprenticeship Scheme. Members are asked to consider at page 304 a copy of a memo from the Committee for the Economy sent to the Department of Finance regarding the NICS Apprenticeship Scheme and what is being done to promote careers within the NICS. Is the committee content to ask the department for a copy of the response of the committee for the economy on this issue? Are we agreed? Okay. Great. Uh, UNISSU. Did I get that right? Yep. Uh, job start scheme and youth unemployment. Members are asked to consider correspondence at page 305 regarding the reported cancellation of the job start scheme. The paper requests the committee's support in urging executive ministers, namely the communities and finance ministers, to reinstate the scheme and ensure it receives the necessary funding. Well, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, just on this, uh, this is something that has worried me for several months. I can remember asking the Communities Minister uh, at a question time around this, and I was told, under no uncertain terms, 
No, we would not be adopting the wider UK scheme because our scheme was going to be better. Mm -hmm. And now we have no scheme uh, in the midst of a, an economic crisis, a scheme that supports employment, especially young people being employed. Uh, this is this could be probably up there with one of the biggest failures this year with regards to this uh, executive, and most particularly, although we'll not get political on it, the economy or the um, uh, communities minister. Uh, she, I asked a question of her and she answered that she was going to deliver a better scheme and yet we have no scheme. Uh, this is a massive issue, it really is. Whenever we can do something to support our people and we, they get nothing. Uh, I think this is something we should pick up and, and write to the Finance Minister because I did raise it at the budget debate yesterday I think it was or maybe Monday, mm, Monday um, yeah. as did others. So, you know, we need to see something now, immediately. Um, and and whether, it's the U, whether it's the wider UK scheme or a Northern Ireland uh, only scheme, that doesn't really matter. It, we just need to get support on the ground and, and, you know, help employment. So we really just see, need to see action on this. Is anybody aware, as the Minister of Communities, is it her intent to start a scheme? Or is it being cancelled because I didn't see any budget lines for it? No budget. Anybody? <coughs> I'm not aware of any but I'm not aware of seeing it in any in the budget bill or the remember. provisions. Okay. Uh, I think sort of members sort of ticking the sort of the, the temperature of the room there. I think yes, we should write to the Minister for Finance seeking clarity and indicating any support for this scheme and other labour market and census schemes in order to support the post COVID recovery. Are we agreed? Great. Okay. Uh, composite request. The members consider the composite request at page 309. The members content the composite request is an accurate record of the committee's information. Say agreed. Agreed. Okay. Moving on to forward work programme. The draft forward work programme is at page 320. A number of additional evidence and sessions have been scheduled on a preliminary basis on a wide range of subjects to discuss last week. These may be subject to change as additional briefings will be required in the public sector pension LCM. Do we have any comments? Are we agreed with the forward work programme as amended? Agreed. Is there any other business? Yes, Mr Chairman. Um, obviously, even Colin Pigeon couldn't have come up with this one, but the, the, the uh, budget was today. Um, there are issues obviously very relevant to this committee. Um, free ports is something we've looked at, for instance, the change in corporation tax and things like that. Um, without wanting to burden the research team too much, could we have a very short briefing? on the implications for financing, particularly this uh, Barnet consequential of four hundred and ten million. Pounds. Yeah. Very keen to know where, where that's going, obviously. Um, is it extra money or is it money we've already built into the budget? If it's extra, well then that's really good news. Uh, um, and when can we expect? Thank you. Uh, team, we've got a because we've got a piece of closed uh, evidence and closed session. Uh, next meeting will be on Wednesday, the 10th of March, uh, in here at 1400 on Chamber and Starleaf. Okay, if we just move into close private session, are we agreed? Agreed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed.